it all happened like I knew it would. A single drop of sauce. Like flies to honey, the monsters swarmed, the rebel panicked, the carnage began. And the Magisters pointed their fingers at me, just as I'd planned. I was shackled and collared, and sent to Fort Joy. I'd come here to kill God Woken. But instead, I became part of their story. What's going on, everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you our story of Divinity Original Sin 2 video series. Now, a couple of qualifiers. Like all of my other story of various Divinity game series, we are only focusing on the main plot and, by extension, some side quests that tie into the main plot. So we're not going to go in-depth into, like, literally every single thing you can do. And realistically, with the nature of this game, I cannot possibly cover every permutation of every decision, though I will try to give you as much information as I possibly can. With those couple things out of the way, as you will have seen in the cinematic you just watched, we are sorcerers that are going to be on our way to the island of Fort Joy, which is where they take sorcerers that have used source magic, thus calling in the Void Woken as source magic appears to do. Now, I'm not going to cover character creation in any particular depths here, as I have in fact already made a video about that, which should be linked down below if all goes well. So if you're interested in the do's and don'ts, all that kind of stuff, you can click on that video and watch it. But jumping straight into it, we wake up with our character, whoever that might be, on this ship, the first floor we awaken to is actually a recently added tutorial section. So. You used to jump up a, uh, a floor, actually, but in a patch they added this lower deck, which actually serves as a small tutorial for new players who are unused to isometric video games in general, but also specifically Divinity games. Once we're done with this area, which will teach you just a little bit about the actual game, you can head up the ladder. Now, once you get up the ladder is where you actually used to start the game proper. So there will be a Magister up here who you can have a short conversation with. Now, this Magister will basically tell us that we have been fitted with a Source Caller, which prevents us from using any kind of Source abilities, and that we are bound for the island of Fort Joy, which we would have also learned from the cinematic. From here, if we leave this room, because there's not really much else we can do, we can walk past a room where there is a dead body with two Magisters investigating. Now, this is really just foreshadowing. When I first played the game, it kind of uh, seemed to insinuate that you might actually be able to solve this murder, and while you technically can, there's nothing we can actually do like as far as coming back to these guys and telling them about it, so we'll just move on. Moving into the main area of this deck of the ship, we actually seem to come to a bit of a common area. Now this is where we can actually meet all of the origin characters who play our named companions. Later in the game, we can actually hire other companions, but they're kind of super generic and don't have a story. The origin characters, which you would have also been able to pick from yourself to play as during character creation, all have their own unique story. Now, I'm not going to be covering their stories a ton, but at the end of each video, I plan on doing a small wrap-up of what we learned about each origin character's potential outcomes. Even the ones I'm not playing with, I will kind of, at the end of each video, go over what each character kind of learns in that act, so you can expect that towards the end of the video. But the origin characters are the Red Prince, who is a prince from the Lizard Empire, Sabeel, who is an elf assassin who was enslaved at some point, Losa, who is a musician who happens to play host to demons and other spirits at times, Ifan Ben Metzt, who used to be a member of the Divine Order, which is the army of the Divine, that is, which we'll get into in a bit. Beast, who is a dwarf pirate. And Fane, who is a 
at this particular point, seemingly a, an elven scholar. We can talk to these guys, which will give us a bit of a flavor of each of their personalities. However, we're not going to dwell on that much here because, again, we're not covering a ton of their stories, but I will go over it kind of towards the end of the video on what we learned from each act, like I mentioned. From here, the only really other thing to do after we're done talking to everyone is honestly go talk to the guy on the upper left of this particular deck who will basically let us through because we have to go get uh, registered, which is what the first magister we spoke to told us to do. So once we go talk to this guy, he will let us through the door after a short conversation where you can make some remarks about how you feel about what's going on. But in the next room, we come across a woman named Wendigo being stopped by two magisters. Now from this conversation, Wendigo here makes it very clear that she murdered the guy that we found earlier. And she's here to kill you, it would seem, because after this conversation, regardless of if you even try to help to, say, start a mutiny, she then goes on to attack everyone and try to seemingly destroy the ship. Functionally, what happens here after this conversation, Wendigo kills almost everyone on board besides the origin characters and a couple others. But, for the most part, everyone's either knocked out or non-responsive at this particular moment because they're dead. We can gather some gear that's in a chest nearby and then head up the stairs to the next deck of the ship. From here, we basically need to escape because, as our character notes, something seems to be banging on the side of the hull of the ship. And you can also occasionally see things come through the sides. If we do a little bit of exploring, there are... A couple of things to note, um, you can talk to a source hunter dog, there's a couple of magisters in the back part of the ship that seem to have been trapped. None of that's really important, you can have another conversation with who turns out to not be an elven scholar, but rather an undead scholar of some sort, and he doesn't really seem to care about what's happening to the ship because he knows that worst case scenario he can literally just walk along the bottom of the sea to shore at some point. Now if we do a little bit of exploring we can find out that this ship was actually also holding something called Death Fog. Death Fog, which if you're unfamiliar with, is exactly what it sounds like. It's fog that instantly kills you. And that is quite literal. So if you as a character walk into Death Fog, it will kill you. It turns out that some of this was being stored on the ship. Now once you're done exploring this deck of the ship, you can actually head up the stairs. And from here, we're actually about to head up to the actual outside area of the ship. Now, as soon as we step out, we're basically attacked by these small slug looking things that are mentioned as Voidwoken. So once we kill them, we can of course make our way out and we find out that the ship is being attacked by a large kraken of sorts. From here, we make all haste to a small lifeboat that is occupied by two children and a dwarf that we would have met earlier. So we can choose to leave immediately or we can respond to what the kids are telling us which is that there are still people on the vote and that we should go back and help them. Now if we choose to go back and help or leave early it doesn't really change much. It will change some dialogue options but that's about it. So what you can do is if you choose to help you can go back down the recently revealed ladder back to one of the original decks we were on where we can save the other origin characters and fight a few more void woken as well as deal with the first magister we actually spoke to or we can just choose to leave immediately both result in the ship being destroyed you being tossed to sea and this short cinematic playing Honorable Dallas, we lost a ship sailing sorcerer prisoners to Fort Joy. We assume some escaped and broke their collars. Their vile magic lured the Voidwoken. All who were aboard are now presumed dead. Yours faithfully into eternity, High Judge Orivan. After that short cinematic where we saw a voice that we don't recognize kind of guide us to the shore through the ocean, basically lift us up out of it, we find ourselves waking up on 
the shore of the island of Fort Joy. Once we do a little bit of exploring and head the only direction really available to us, we run into a few more of the Void Woken that we just saw earlier. And from here, we can actually start putting our party together. Now we can have up to four party members, including ourselves, which allows us to take on three other origin characters as well as our avatar. And if you are playing an origin character, up to four origin characters. So in the actual area of Fort Joy, in and around, you will find the other origin characters that you saved, and then you can, through dialogue, recruit them to your party. Now, again, we're not really going to cover a ton of that right this second. Now, when we're ready, we can actually head to the gates of Fort Joy proper, where we can see this scene between Alexander, the son of Lucian the Divine, his right-hand person, Dallas, and a Magister. They accuse, Dallas and Alexander, that is, this Magister of helping people escape. And nothing you do really affects this too much. However, at the end of it, the Magister in question is outright killed by Dallas, who is known as the Hammer. That brings us to Fort Joy proper. Now, basically, we're tasked with escaping Fort Joy. So here's the thing. I've already made a video about all the ways to escape Fort Joy, so that will also be linked down below. You can look at that if you want, so we're not going to spend a huge amount of time on all of the ways that you can escape. However, I am going to go over a few of the important bits of information that you will find in Fort Joy, actually inside the fort, and they are this stuff. So, you can meet an elven seer named Sahela. She is important to the story later, and she explains that basically elves are in a bad way because Lucian, years ago when he was fighting to banish Damien, killed a ton of them with Death Fog, actually. And Sahela is one of the last of the Elven Seers. Throughout the entire island of Fort Joy, but especially in the fort, we can find all sorts of mentions of a Brachus Rex, who is referred to as the Source King. Now he died thousands of years ago, originally, and then in the events of Divinity Original Sin, he's actually killed again after he was resurrected. That again becomes important later. Also, we can find out about geists, or silent monks as they're sometimes referred to as. So inside Fort Joy, we can run into a couple of these. In the actual area where we're being confined at right now, we can do a short side quest involving a geist that is on a beach. And basically it's like a mindless monster almost that kind of introduces you to them. Inside the fort, we can actually run into a guy named High Judge Oravand, who actually explains what's happening. So basically, Source is this life energy. If you haven't played the other games and you don't know that, you're just finding this out from High Judge Oravand when you sneak into his room, or barge in one or the other. Judge Oravand explains that basically, Source is this life energy, and the people who can channel it, when they do so, it calls Void Woken, which then kill a bunch of people. So in order to solve this problem, they've been sending people to Fort Joy. Anybody who can channel Source gets sent to Fort Joy as a prisoner. And then from there, they are purged of that Source through a process that is not awesome. So High Judge Oravand shows us this process, but basically it leaves the person in question that was just purged of their Source in a bad way and basically turns them into geists. They're like zombies almost. They're like, you know, the lights are on but nobody's home kind of thing. And then we can actually run into a guy named Virtus in the dungeons. So Virtus is important because he is actually a god woken, which we don't know right now, but it's made very obvious. The important thing about Virtus is that he is one of many clues you can find that will point you towards a secret group of seekers in the swamps of Fort Joy proper, the actual island. This, in combination with all the other rumors that we can find in and around the fort about these seekers, including the conversation we ran into between uh, Alexander and Dallas and all them, where they're accusing Magister Atusa of sending people to these seekers. Obviously, once we escape, we can go looking for this camp that is supposed to be out there in the swamp of these seekers who are apparently helping refugees. Now the last thing I want to mention before we start moving on to the rest of the island is Paladin Cork. So if you actually go to like the main courtyard area of the Fort Joy Fort, you will find Paladin Cork asking to be let in to basically inspect and see what's going on inside. And he has refused entry and they actually outright attack him. So this is an important conversation because this is what tells you that the Magisters and the... Paladins of the Divine Order are at odds. 
So technically, the Divine Order is the militant arm of the Divine, who is the embodiment of the seven gods in Rivalon, which is the subject of several of the other Divinity games, but if you're just now learning of it, the Divine is in fact the embodiment because he's a piece of power of every god in one person. And the Paladins are his direct followers, and since the divine Lucian died about, well, supposed to have died, nine years before the events of this game, some of his army has split into groups. So the Magisters are one of those groups. Now the Magisters serve his son, Alexander, which is the guy we ran into earlier. Just a little bit of world building because that's an important conversation. So now you know that the Paladins and the Magisters are not getting along or at least the Magisters are deliberately keeping secrets from the Paladins, we should say. So once we leave Fort Joy, we can run into Zalaskar, which is an undead guy in the swamp who is the subject of a few quests. And we can actually also run into Wendigo, the very woman who caused all that destruction on the ship we were on, who basically flat out tried to kill us. Now, Zalaskar is non-violent. We do not have to fight him at all. Now, Wendigo, when you run into her, will try to kill you outright again. These two are important because conversations with them point to the undead being raised recently in droves by some outside force for some sort of pact. They won't really give you any details and it is, you know, mostly just kind of foreshadowing. Once we actually start exploring the swamps of the island of Fort Joy, we can run into a ruins where we will get attacked by a ton of Voidwoken, and we'll also start hearing voices as we walk over certain areas of the map, kind of guiding us to a certain location. The voice we heard that pulled us out of the water when we first came to the island, actually. From here, ideally, we're going to want to find the Camp of Seekers. So it's actually not hard to find. It's probably the easiest place to get to, as it is just beyond the ruin I just mentioned and is kind of avoids a ton of fights that you would otherwise have to have. So once we get to this camp, we're going to obviously talk to the Seekers that are there, and they're going to explain a couple things. That A, they've already had one fight with the Magisters when they arrived, and they're not doing great because the Magisters are employing a weapon known as Shriekers. So, the Magisters have been studying the things about Brockus Rex they've found here. Now, if you remember, Brockus Rex is the Source King. Well, the island of Fort Joy was Brockus Rex's stronghold. It's where he did a ton of research into Source and what it can do. The Magisters have been looking into that research, and what they've come up with is a weapon called Shriekers. Shriekers are awful. Basically, they put a person up on a pike, that person slowly decays into a Shrieker. It's kind of like a crucifixion almost. And that power actually enables the Shrieker to basically channel pure source, which instantly kills people. So basically, the Seekers are asking you to do two things. Find a weapon to kill the Shriekers, and also find their leader Gareth, because Gareth went off to find a weapon to kill the Shriekers with, and he hasn't come back. So, from here, where I actually recommend going first is actually really close to the Seekers camp. It's just down a vine thing and across a beach to Brockus Rex's vault. Now, we can actually find a couple of books around the island that point us to this location, or you can just stumble across it. Brockus Rex's vault is roughly down the vine. It's like right next to the Seekers camp. It's pretty hard to miss. In that vault, we will be accosted, let's say, by a undead guy named Trompdoy, I guess. Now, as we traverse the cavern, it turns out that Trompdoy is one of many people that Brockus Rex cursed, and he tasked Trompdoy with protecting this vault. Once you get to the end of this, which actually involves uh, deliberately fighting Trompdoy and seeing through his illusions, because he was a bard of sorts, we can make our way to the actual vault part of Brockus Rex's vault. Now, in this vault, we will find A, a weapon that can kill the Shriekers, which is nice. There's actually several, but here's one of them. We can also find a ton of soul jars, and we can have one last conversation with Trompdoy. One of the soul, jar, soul jars is Trompdoy's. Now, basically, the soul jars are exactly that. They hold someone's soul. So if you destroy Trompdoy's soul jar, he can finally rest, which is what he really wants, and he apologizes for harassing you all the way through this dungeon. Make your decision. It doesn't really matter. Now, all these other soul jars belong to a few different people. Three of them we probably haven't met yet. The other two belong to a Captain Zepsicor, as well as a Gratiana. So... 
Captain Zepp Sikor is part of the Relics of Rivalon DC, which, uh, DLC, gift bag, which gives you a armor set for completing it. You should totally do it, but it's not relevant to the main plot. Gratiana is actually someone you've probably met in the Seekers camp. Gratiana, as it turns out, if you take this soul jar back to her and have a conversation with her, she tells you that she actually used to be Brockus Rex's concubine because she is undead in that if you give her her soul jar, she would appreciate it, or you can destroy it and kill her because she has done awful things in her past despite being redeemed now. Honestly, this choice doesn't matter. It's kind of really just however you feel about it. However, it, it affects literally like one inslide, and basically it's if you let her live, she gets added to an inslide. That's literally it. So beyond that, do what you will. It is a neat little side story that though that you should look into. Before we actually leave Brockus Rex's vault, as we go to leave, you will notice a statue in a room not too far away from you. If you interact with this statue, because it is interactable, it will... Um, basically enthrall you and you'll find yourself teleported to a place called the Hall of Echoes. Now here's where things get interesting. This actually differs depending on what type of character you are playing, but the long and short of it is you will meet your character's appropriated god. If you are playing, say, Ifan, you will meet Rollick. If you are playing Beast, you'll meet Duna. If you're playing Sabeel, you'll meet Tercendilius. You meet the god appropriate to your race, because in Rivalon, there are these seven gods who created the races. Technically, there's only six races, but one of those gods, Amadia, decided that because she didn't have a race to make, she was going to be in charge of the wizards of the world. So if you choose to play a non-origin character who is also, like, undead or something, you'll get Amadia. Amadia is kind of the default catch-all god for this particular situation, by the way. But basically, your character will meet whatever divine or otherwise being in this conversation who will grant you the power to bless. And basically, in this conversation, in addition to being taught how to bless, your god explains that you are godwoken, which means you are basically a champion of the gods with the potential of becoming the next divine. Because as I mentioned earlier, the previous divine died several years ago, and there needs to be a new one. And the term for the people who can take up that mantle is Godwoken. So your god has chosen you, that's the voice you've been hearing, and should you choose to follow its commands and gain power, you'll be good to go. But first order of business is getting the hell off of this island. And that's basically the mission your god gives you, is literally just to get off this island as of right now. So from here we can finally exit the vault of Brockus Rex which leaves us with saving Gareth as we found a wand to destroy the Shriekers with in the vault itself. North of the Seekers camp, we can actually find Brockus Rex's armory. Now, in this particular area is where we can find Gareth. He is being attacked by Magisters, we can save him, and he'll explain that he was at the armory looking for a weapon to kill the Shriekers with, and he'll appreciate you saving him, and he'll leave. Now, if you choose to explore the armory at all, you can find the Helmet of Brockus Rex, which basically gives you the same power as the wand that you found in Brockus Rex's vault, which is to drain the source from a target which then kills it, which in the Shriekers case just completely kills them outright. So that is one, again, of several weapons you can find to deal with the Shriekers that you're going to be finding soon. Now once we've saved Gareth, we can go back to the Seekers camp and speak to him there, where basically he'll explain that, you know, you need a weapon to deal with the Shriekers, but because we already have that, you can then go like, yeah, we totally have that, we've, we've got it covered already. Gareth will also take this time to explain if you talk to him that Seekers are, again, a faction of the Divine Order, but their specific mission is to find and guide Godwoken on the path to becoming the actual Divine. Because of that, and the fact that you yourself are Godwoken, they're here to help you, basically. Now, once we've saved Gareth and we have in fact rallied the Seekers through finding a weapon to deal with the Shriekers that are blocking the harbor, of Fort Joy, which is where we can leave from, we can basically send them off to the harbor area. Now from here, they will actually abandon the Seekers camp you're at and they will move across the way a little bit to the harbor area of Fort Joy, to a camp set up there just outside of the harbor. Once we go to the camp, we can talk to uh, Gareth or Gratiana and basically tell them we're ready, but that won't actually do anything. The way to advance this particular part of the game is to actually de physically destroy the five or six Seekers that are guarding the harbor. Technically, you don't have to destroy them, but that's what's gonna get the next uh, phases of conversation rolling, shall we say? Now, from here, uh, Gareth and the Seekers will advance forward, and basically they'll say that 
Gareth is going to take a bunch of them and row out to the actual ship you plan on leaving from while you and your party deal with the Magisters at the actual harbor, which happens to include Alexander. We will have to fight and kill Alexander here. So this is a tough fight, obviously. This is the uh, last boss fight, shall we say, of Act 1. It is difficult, especially for newer players, especially if you're on a higher difficulty. So when you actually damage Alexander's health, he will, well, he won't personally, but a Void Woken will be summoned into the fight that will then distract all of the adds because there are a ton of adds. Just keep in mind, this is a tough fight. If you're playing on a higher difficulties, I actually recommend teleporting Alexander away from all of his enemies so they have to waste a turn or two getting to you while you guys all gang up on Alexander and hopefully kill him before you have to deal with the adds. So once you win this fight, you will be immediately accosted by a woman named Malady who appears to be half elf, half demon. And Malady will immediately recognize you as Godwoken. And from this conversation, she'll explain that she needs to take you to a woman named Meister Siva in Reaper's Coast who will help guide you, because she's a member of the Seekers as well, Meister Siva that is, and she will help guide you on your path to divinity as you are Godwoken. So Malady at this point will, if you have not already taken your particular collar off, she will break the source collars around the necks of all of your party members if any of them still have them on, which will of course allow you to access your source magic. So that will actually wrap up Act 1, but I did mention that we are going to go over everything that happens with the origin characters in the end of each video. So. Honestly, in Act 1, not a ton happens. So, to explain it rather briefly, the Red Prince, he will learn that he needs to find a dreamer named Brahmos on Reaper's Coast, basically. So lizards have these members of their society known as dreamers, and those dreams that those dreamers have will allow them to have visions of things. The Red Prince is looking for someone, and these dreamers are basically telling him who to look for, but basically none of the dreamers on Fort Joy are strong enough with their gift to tell him exactly where to look. So they basically tell him to go find their head dreamer guy, a guy named uh, Brahmos, on Reaper's Coast, and that's basically it. Sabeel is a slave escapee who was forced to kill a bunch of people using the slave scar on her cheek. So lizards have this practice of using what they call slave scars, and then through songs they can activate the magic of that slave scar and basically force the slave to do anything they want. Sabeel was unfortunately one of these slaves, but she escaped. She's trying to track down the person who kidnapped her and delivered her to her slaver. She will actually talk to Zalaskar, one of the undead in the swamps, and that person will be like, oh yeah, you're looking for a guy named Roost Anlon. He's in uh, Driftwood Reaper's Coast area, and he'll tell Sabeel where to go for that. High fan Ben Metz actually has probably the most interesting of all of the personal story things going on right here. I fan Ben Metz is a member of the Lone Wolves, and he was tasked with doing nothing short of killing Alexander. So, obviously, the last one act boss is Alexander, so I fan will have, of course, killed Alexander. And now he needs to report back to Roost Anlon, the leader of the Lone Wolves in Reaper's Coast. Beast, the dwarf origin character, probably has the least going on in Act 1, to be honest with you. Not much, really. He's trying to get back at his uh, cousin, the Queen of the Dwarves, who basically had him captured and sent to Fort Joy in a lot of ways. But basically, he just needs to get back to Driftwood so he can talk to some dwarves about what's going on with that situation. Because he uncovered a plot of sorts with the Queen. So Beast probably has the least going on in the Fort Joy area. Basically all Beast does is find the location of a guy named Lohar who he needs to talk to, which is another dwarf who is also in the Driftwood Reaper's Coast area. The Undead Scholar was investigating the Black Pits, which is an area in Reaper's Coast, and he would very much so like to go back there to continue his research. So that's where he is headed. And he can also hopefully repair his mask of the shapeshifter that was broken, or he can recover it from Windigo and give it back to Fane. And that mask is what allows him to don the look of other races and not look undead, and thus very noticeable everywhere he goes. And then lastly, Losa. So Losa, if you go to talk to Sahela with Losa in your party, becomes very apparent that she is being possessed, Losa that is, by a demon who is slowly taking over her soul. Basically, Losa needs to find someone 
to help her with this. And that someone, you guessed it, is in Driftwood Reaper's Coast area. So basically what you know about Losa is that she's slowly being taken over by a demon and she's trying to find somebody to help her with this problem like ASAP. So that is kind of everything that's going on with the origin characters in the Act 1 Fort Joy area. Now in Act 2 we're actually going to cover the boat ride to Driftwood Reaper's Coast area because that is actually part of uh, the transitional period between the acts but I'm going to cover that in the Act 2 video as well. So there it is guys, um, the main plot and everything surrounding Act 1 of Divinity Original Sin 2. I certainly hope you guys enjoyed it. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything like that, by all means let me know down in the description below where you can also find the links to the two videos I mentioned earlier in this video as well. So Thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. Tired but victorious, the party made for the Lady Vengeance. The horrors of Fort Joy behind them. They arrived as sorcerers. They left as Godwoken. The fate of this godforsaken world now rested on their shoulders. Or at least on the shoulders of one of them. What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you part two of our Divinity Original Sin 2 story series where I cover the main plot. So just as a reminder, if you didn't watch part one, I'm not covering like a ton of the side quests. I'm going to cover some of them because they're inherently related to the main plot, but for the most part I'm not focusing on them at all. I'm not really covering the origin stories in depth, but at the end of the video, I will recap what we learned about all six of the origin stories in the act that we're focusing on, which today is, of course, Act 2. Now, in Act 1, we left off with our heroes having managed to escape Fort Joy, and they are traveling with Malady to the ship that was attacked by the Seekers so we could leave the island while we fought Bishop Alexander. When we arrive on the ship, our companions that are with us, whoever we chose to hang out with in Fort Joy, will immediately leave the party. Now, if you did not talk to any of the Origin characters, they will still be on the ship here. Just because you didn't speak to them on Fort Joy doesn't mean they didn't come with onto the ship. Once that's done, we can go talk to Malady and Gareth, who are having an argument up on the main deck of the ship near the steering wheel. They are having a bit of a disagreement because Malady is super callous about all of the people that died, which, by the way, if you don't see all the bodies, a bunch of the Seekers at the camp you were at in Fort Joy, the Seekers camp, have in fact died during this battle. There's still quite a few alive, but many of them did not make it. Gareth and Malady both explain that the ship won't move because it is not a regular ship. It is a ship made out of live wood called the Lady Vengeance. And live wood, if you're unfamiliar, is basically the wood from an ancestor tree, which is a tree inhabited by the spirit of an elf, which means they took wood that was literally inhabited by a sentient being and turned it into a ship. And for whatever reason, this ship refuses to move. Presumably because you are not Dallas, who the ship actually belongs to. We met her in Act 1 as well. So basically this conversation tells us that we need to get this ship moving, explore and figure it out. Now, this is a good time to re-recruit the companions that you plan on using. So whatever origin characters you're hanging out or whoever you want to have in your party, you need to recruit them now. And I mean, like before you get the ship moving. Bit of a spoiler alert before we get into the actual part of it. This is the point of no return for the origin characters. Whoever you leave this ship with is basically your choice for the rest of the game. Um, the other options that you did not choose to hang out with, they, uh, well, spoiler alert, they die on this ship in just a little bit, actually. With that out of the way, recruit your companions you plan on getting and then, you know, book it on. Real quick before we go into the rest of the explanation though, I will say that everything in Act 1 choice-wise doesn't matter a ton. There are a few things that can carry over, you know, like uh, say if Gareth happened to die, the story will continue. However, obviously Gareth won't be aboard the ship with you now, that kind of stuff. But the game will continue. So there are a few things from Act 1 that can carry over like that, but mostly, most of your decisions in Act 1 with Fort Joy, they don't matter. Not in like terms of actual outcomes you have to deal with, I'll put it that way. That said, pretty much from this point on, the decisions you make tend to have effects later in the game, so that's just something to keep in mind. 
Back to the matter at hand. The ship is made of live wood. It won't move. We need to get it to move. We need to explore. So, basically what you need to do here is find a book on a soldier that is dead on the main deck here. And it is actually a diary where he explains that he heard someone trying to talk to a door that requires a password, and they said Fortitude is the password. And while you're nearby that soldier, you may be tempted to go talk to the Lady Vengeance because the, like, the head at the front of the ship, I don't pretend to know what they call that, I assume there's an actual name for it, but that serves as the ship's head. And if you go try to talk to it before you figure this quest out, your character will die and you'll have to be resurrected. Now, in addition to Maudie and Gareth telling us about the ship, they also mention that Bishop Alexander is not dead, despite us trying to kill him at the end of Act 1 and him serving as the last boss of Act 1. He somehow survived and is unconscious in the very bottom of the ship. Once we have the book from the soldier, we can go down to that part of the ship, where we will also find a magic mirror, by the way. Mirrors uh, will let you re-roll your character if you're unhappy with how they are. Just a side note, not super important to the story. We'll find Alexander being guarded by a Seeker and a Magister. The Seeker can be persuaded to let you in, and the Magister will be protecting Alexander. And it is possible to instigate a fight with that Magister. It would you know, like not aggro anybody, because you know it's a Magister and the Seekers don't care if that Magister dies. That said, you can kill Alexander again right here. Again, it, it doesn't really matter. Kill him if you want. We'll talk about the consequences of that decision later. Or search his body. And, you know, if you kill him, then search his body. Otherwise, just, like, frisk the guy while he's asleep through dialogue. And you will find a special necklace that looks important. Grab it, and then on the ship you'll make your way to this very odd-looking door that you've probably noticed already by just exploring the ship. This door, I forget the exact name for it, they do mention it, but honestly I don't remember what it was. But either way, uh, this is a door that is inhabited by some sort of spirit to take basic commands. Now what you need to do is use the necklace you found on Alexander's body, put it in the door, and then speak the password, which is fortitude, to get it to open which opens up Dallas's chambers, where she presumably kept the secret of how to get the ship moving. Now in here, you're going to meet a guy named Tarquin. Through dialogue, you will find out that this man was kept by Dallas and forced to do magical projects for her, which is very important to the story later. However, he's very clearly a necromancer, and should you choose to, you can act actually just kill him outright. It's fine. He's, you know, not like the nicest guy in the world and he's super shady so totally understandable decision should you choose to do that however i recommend you don't he is involved with an integral side quest and i say integral because it gives you a really awesome item at the end of it and i actually don't want to spoil it but while tarquin actually has an important role in the main story it already happened before you meet him if that makes sense he did something that is important later but his continued existence is unimportant but we'll get into all that in the future so, once we've dealt with Tarquin however we deemed necessary, we will find a book that explains the lizard slave marks used in the ancient empire of the lizards, and how they activate them through songs. And in this book, we will find the song needed to restart the live wood ship, and basically awaken it to listen to us so it will sail us where we need to go. Now, in this room, before you leave, you can pick up the teleporter pyramids, which are an awesome mechanic. Basically, you pick them up and they can teleport you to any of the other teleporter pyramids. So one you'll find on the table next to Tarquin, and when you pick it up to find the other one, you can either find a hatch in this room or you can just do the more fun thing, which is to activate the other teleporter pyramid, which will then teleport you to the one you're missing, which is a throwback all the way to the original Divine Divinity, which was fun. If you choose to do that, you're going to fight two Geists, which are the Geists that Dallas had at her side when we saw her in Act 1. So you'll have to kill those guys to pick up the second teleporter pyramid, but you should totally do that. They're very handy. Once we have all that, we need to go talk to the ship. So we bring that book, we sing the song to the ship, it awakens, it basically asks, you know, are you going to set it free and let it be a ship, or are you going to force it to do your bidding like Dallas did? Either way, the ship will, you know, be your base. Either it'll be thankful for freeing it, and you know, it's a ship, so it's still got to sail somewhere, or you'll forcefully tell it where to go. It doesn't really make much of a difference, but just to give you some flavor of the conversation. Unfortunately, while we are taking off, we are intercepted by Dallas and a guy named Riedemann. With the sun on their backs and the wind in their sails, the god woke and watched Fort Joy shrink behind them. But their captain. 
capture of the Lady Vengeance had not gone unnoticed. Now, Vredeman, if you read Bishop Alexander's diary when you defeated him in Act 1, he will mention that Dallas was having him trained by a guy named Vredeman because Bishop Alexander is himself a godwoken, being the son of Lucian the Divine, and that in order to expand his knowledge and for him to hopefully ascend to the mantle of Divine, they gave him a tutor, a guy named Vredeman, who for whatever reason seems insanely loyal to Dallas. There is a reason why, but we'll get into all of that later. It's not super important right this second. Now, during this fight, most all of the Seekers that survived the initial battle die the first round of this fight because Vredeman summons a Meteor Strike and kills all of them right in front of you. Now, the objective of this fight is not to win. It's incredible. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's incredibly difficult to like win this through straight up killing everything. What you need to do is protect Malady. So Malady is going to start channeling a spell, which you don't really know what it's going to do, but clearly it's the exit. It seems like a teleport of some sort upon your first viewing. You need to just protect Malady for about, I think it's five or six turns before she finishes casting whatever spell it is she's casting. Now, I will say, if you're having trouble with this fight, because it can be a bit of a pain on higher difficulties if you're kind of new to the game, the best thing to do, in my opinion, is use the Medusa Head skill from the Metamorph tree, because most of the enemies in this fight, actually a lot of them don't have magic armor to resist that, and the ones that do don't have a ton of it. So it's actually really easy to just completely lock the entire set of enemies down with the Medusa Head ability, and cheese walk this even on like honor mode. That said, once Malady manages to get her spell off, she teleports the entire ship to the Hall of Echoes. Now once With the help of the half demon Malady, the god woken escaped through the veil that separates life from death. To get to the Hall of Echoes after this fight, you're going to wake up in kind of a strange place. While you follow the path down, you're going to see the gods strung up in a tree. You need to find your character's god, the one that spoke to you earlier in Act 1. You need to use the bless skill that they gave you on that character, and then your god will wake up and have a conversation where they explain that the void is draining the gods of their power, and it is absolutely imperative that a new divine rise and rise quickly. The gods are afraid. They're about to be wiped out by the void, so time is of the essence. And with that in mind, your god transports you back to consciousness, which you wake up on the Lady Vengeance inside the Hall of Echoes kind of sailing through the air. We need to actually head down below decks where we will pass the dead origin characters that did not make it. Because like I said, any origin characters that did not come with you past talking to the Lady Vengeance straight up died in the fight. From here, we need to go down to the bottom deck. We need to talk to Malady and Co, where Malady will finish teleporting us out of the Hall of Echoes outside of Driftwood in Reaper's Coast. The chill of the Hall of Echoes clung to the Lady Vengeance as it returned to the shores of Reaper's Coast. The Godwoken were alive, but what of the gods? Now, once we arrive in Reaper's Coast, we can talk to Malady again, where she's going to instruct us to go find Meister Siva, the head of the Seekers, because Meister Siva will know what to do to how will know what to do to continue you on your path to becoming the divine. You can take this time to explain to Malady what happened to the gods and what you saw, or keep it to yourself, it doesn't matter a ton. But from here, you can go over to a small rowboat that is uh, docked on the side of the Lady Vengeance, and you can use that to get to shore. Once you're going along the shore, you're probably going to come across this caravan right outside of Driftwood that was attacked by Voidwoken, and there's dead everywhere. Slightly north of this area is the entrance to the town of Driftwood, and within viewing distance of that entrance, you can actually see a gallows. If you go to that gallows, you can actually find Meister Siva uh, strung up, shall we say, ready for the gallows. <laughs> she's being punished because, you know, she's a sorcerer. But they know who she is, that she's the head of the Seekers, so they are intentionally torturing this woman. 
Now, because we need to talk to Meister Siva, we obviously need to free her, and we do that by, you know, freeing her and getting into a fight with all these magisters by doing so, or killing them first and then freeing her. It doesn't matter a ton. Either way, you're going to have to fight these magisters is really what it boils down to. And it is a bit of a pain. So you need to separate the, on higher difficulties, mind you, I should say. If you're playing on higher difficulties, you need to separate the main one, Executor Ninian or Ninian. I don't know how to pronounce her name. But she will have an evasion aura that you need to deal with. Because if she's close to other characters, she gives them an aura of evasion and makes them incredibly hard to hit, which is very annoying. Once you finish this fight, you can talk to Meister Siva, where she heads back to her house in Driftwood and is incredibly rude to you the entire time. Now, from here, we need to follow her to her house, deal with her being incredibly rude, get down into her vault, where she has all of her... where she will explain to you the process of continuing on the path of becoming divine. There is actually a ritual you will need to perform. She has the ingredients for performing the ritual once in her vault here, which you can then grab, which is a ritual bowl, a lancelet, as well as a substance called black root. So you put the black root in the bowl, you stab yourself with the lancet, mix your blood in with the black root, and then set that bowl on fire, and it will create a foggy portal. If you have a source point, you can click on that portal to be transported to the Hall of Echoes, or at least the tile set for the Hall of Echoes, because technically you're looking inside your own soul. But Meister Siva explains all this, and then we of course do it. And when we go into our soul, we find our god yet again. This time, our god explains that they've had to take refuge in your soul to hide from the void. And they will give you the ability of spirit vision. And then the particular entity that is giving you this information will tell you that in order to become the next divine, you need to greatly expand your ability to channel source, because source is life, basically. What they instruct us to do is find masters of the source who can teach us to expand our source abilities. So that's the information we get sent off with, and then we head back into the real world where we can tell Meister Siva about this. Meister Siva will explain that there should be a list of known sorcerers who were too powerful to capture in the Magister's barracks. However, I will tell you, that is not all of them. There are a couple more besides what is in this list that you can find down there. Now, this is going to be the bulk of Act 2 right here, is finding these masters, doing what they ask of you so you can learn to channel source, or killing them, because honestly, most of them are terrible. We are going to go through these masters that you can find in Act 2 one by one. Now, I want to say, you do not have to do what they're asking of you to expand your source. The game will continue even if all of these masters die before teaching you what you need to know. However, we are going to go over what happens in that case towards the end. So for now, we're going to go through each master, kind of explain what you need to do to learn from them. But keep in mind, even if you just kill them outright, because again, many of them are awful, awful people, it doesn't really matter because the game will continue. So the easiest one to start with is Mortis. And I say that because A, it's, it's probably the only level appropriate one to follow right when you get to Driftwood. And moreover, his whole thing kind of starts in Driftwood, so it just makes logical sense to start with Mortis. Mortis is actually working for the dwarves that are located in Driftwood as well. There's a bit of like a criminal dwarven activity going on in Driftwood, and Mortis works for them. This is also the subject of the side quest where you side with either the Magisters or the Dwarves in Driftwood. And because I hate Magisters, I pretty much always side with the Dwarves, but keep in mind you can side with the Magisters and then do that route as well. But basically, I recommend killing all the Magisters you see because they're the worst. Especially the White Magister Raimund because you can meet him here in Driftwood. You don't really understand his importance as a character yet. However, you can choose to side with the Magisters and help him in his investigation, but he leaves that in the hands of a guy standing next to him, known as Magister, I believe it's Julian is his name. You can go that way, help the Magisters, or you know, you can do what I like to do, which is kill them, because if you kill Magister Raymond now, it saves you a lot of trouble later. I won't elaborate more than that, but like, it's a difficult fight now, but it's a lot easier if you do it now rather than later. Like I said, you can side with the dwarves. So if you side with the dwarves, you meet a dwarf named Lohar, and he was recently attacked by a seemingly mind-controlled woman that worked for him for an incredibly long time, who was practically family. He helped raise this girl, and she out of nowhere tried to kill him and is babbling like a loon. 
So Lohar explains that this is obviously very unusual behavior, and a guy who works for him named Mortis is missing, and that's a problem. He asks you to go investigate Mortis's house. And if you do that, you will find that some of Lohar's dwarves are in fact guarding the place, but if you tell them Lohar sent you, they're like, all right, whatever, go do your thing. And when you search Mortis's house, you will find his notes about how he is trying to perform a ritual called the Mord Akim and has been mind-controlling dwarves to do what he wants them to do. But more importantly, he explains that he's doing all this from a cave in the cliffs to the west of town. So that's obviously where we're going to head next. And as we head through the cliffs there, we get attacked by possessed dwarves several times. There's a fight with some void woken again until we reach the actual cave where all this is happening at. Now this part is crazy and it's probably some of the best stuff done in act two, to be honest. So when you arrive inside this cave, you'll find bodies everywhere. There's a dwarf uh, girl scared out of her mind shouting about stuff. And as you go forward, you'll come to a dead end. Now you have two options here, and this is actually what I love about the level design of this place. If you go to the very edge of this cliff and actually use abilities to jump down, you can skip this entire dungeon. <laughs> However, if you don't have an ability or you don't realize you can make it down to the area where you can see, and you turn around, you'll be attacked by four Void Woken. And you can't win this fight. They will cocoon your people, wrap you guys up, and then take you into a dungeon where they will separate your group and you have to kind of bring them back together. By the way, if you have the teleporter pyramids, that's a lot easier to do. But basically, you gotta get all your guys back together in this cave that is filled with Void Woken. And down here, you'll find a couple of things that are important. One, uh, you can find a dwarf woman working in a laboratory of sorts, and she's also clearly insane, but she is tinkering with a device that delivers death fog. Death fog, if you remember, is a substance that kills people on contact. If you're alive and you get hit by death fog, congratulations, now you're dead. And she's tinkering with a device that, you know, uses it, a device that is used to deliver death fog. She explains that this device was actually crafted by a woman named Hanneg, which is actually a lizard woman. So, this is also important because she explains that this is being done at Queen Justinia, the queen of the dwarves behest, and that's all that we're going to go into with that right now. From here, once we get out of this dungeon and back up to where technically we just were, the lower part of the first area of the dungeon that you come into that you could have jumped down to, and you will find Mortis up ahead. Like many of the fights in honor mode or tactician mode, I, rec I recommend a certain amount of cheese on tactician and stuff. This is a difficult fight if you try to do it outright. However, if you don't waste your time trying to talk to Mortis and just teleport him up to where you start the fight or uh, start the area at on top of this little ship area, you can basically avoid all of his guys for like two or three turns uh, and focus him down. Because once he goes down, the rest of them die. So that said, if you kill a bunch of the enemies that are his followers without killing him, he uses a ritual called the Mordekim, or Mordekaim, however you want to pronounce it, to grow exponentially in power and becomes damn near impossible. So do yourself a favor, just cheese this fight if you're on a high difficulty. Once you defeat him, he does not die. He actually goes down and then you have a conversation with him. Now, you can use this conversation to have him explain what the hell he's doing down here, which is basically that he is doing this to all these people, killing all these people, mind controlling all these people to perform a ritual called the Mordecai, which will give him a ton of power. He learned of this ritual through an entity known as the God King. Who, which is why he's in league with the Void, because the God King works for the Void. Now, we don't get a ton of information on that right here. We actually get more on that later, but that's kind of the gist of it. Now, basically, we can be like, all right, Mortis, teach us how to channel more source since you're a master of it, and we won't kill you. You can then learn to channel one extra point of source this way. Doing so is gross. This is probably a pretty gross dialogue option, to be honest. He produces some black tumory thing and makes you eat it, but it does in fact expand your ability to channel source. And at this point, you can let him go or kill him. Or you can kill him outright. You can kill him without eating the cancery tumor thing and not learning to expand your source. That's how Mortis wraps up. And from here, you can take the information about Mortis and all of the information about what Queen Justinia is doing back to Lohar, and that will resolve that quest thread. Now from there we move on to the next master of source. The easiest one after this is usually Riker. 
Riker is a elf in the Stone Garden Cemetery nearby, and he is a weirdo. So <laughs> he's super into necromancy, and he basically reanimates people and corpses and lives by himself with all these undead mass servants. He does seem to have a thing for animals, though, because you will find them all over his mansion in the cemetery, which is weird. If you go talk to Riker, he does not immediately attack you, but you do go talk to him. And he knows why you're there. He knows that you want to learn how to channel more source, and he says he'll teach you to do this if you go do something for him. That nearby is an area called the Black Pits. And in the Black Pits, there is a tablet that he needs. And if you bring it to him, he will teach you how to channel more source. So for Riker, we're going to do exactly that. Now, Black Pits actually has a ton going on. There is tons of stuff happening in the Black Pits. But focusing on specifically what we need to do for Riker, we need to go down there. We need to enter the cave in the Black Pits, get down to the bottom of the Black Pits, which is actually an area that used to be some sort of temple or something for the Eternals. While we're down there, we're going to learn that the Magisters were already there and that Dallas had them searching for something and they found it. It was called the Atiran. We don't know exactly what it is, but once we get to the very bottom of the Black Pits, which was like this uh, eternal race temple thing, we can find a trapped eternal known as Atira. And Atira gives us a ton of information and is a big plot moment when this happens. So Atira explains that basically um, the gods aren't really gods, that they stole their power from the god king and the rest of the Eternals once the scholar Fane, the, say, the exact same origin character that you can play with, discovered a thing called the Veil, which was this kind of blanket of source that separated Rivalon from the Void. When the Seven Lords, who later became the Seven Gods, learned about this, they used that information to sabotage the entire rest of the Eternal Race and cast them into the Void so they could take the divine power of the source for themselves, thus becoming gods. Atira, in addition to giving this information, is also the creator of the Atiran which is a wand that can drain the source from absolutely anything with no limit on how much. Which is obviously a very big deal when you're a god whose entire existence relies on source. So we get all of that information from Atira. We will then fight Atira. That's an annoying fight too. Use Medusa Head makes it a ton easier. But once we get done with that fight, we will actually be able to find the tablet that Riker was looking for, and then we can take that tablet back to Riker. Once we do that, we can again have Riker expand our source or kill him because he's the worst. That said, even if he expands your source, he will then attack you. Unlike with the Mortis situation where you could let him go afterwards, there's no situation where Riker doesn't try to kill you even if he expands your source channeling abilities. Now, after you defeat Riker, I just want to mention that in the basement of his mansion here is where you'll find the other set, of, well, one of the other teleporter pyramids. There's this chest in a room across the way and you need like a source points to get into it, but it will have the other, well, one of the other teleporter pyramids for giving you a total of three out of four of them. Because we were in the Black Pits area, the next one we are going to talk about is Hanag. Now actually in the forest to the west, we can actually first run into Hanag, where she actually is. And she is being attacked by Magisters because of course, you know, she's a sorcerer. And if we choose to help Hanag by killing these Magisters that are trying to pursue her, she will stop channeling all the crazy environmental magic and allow you to come talk to her. Hanag is a master of portal magic, and as I mentioned earlier, she also invented the death fog delivery device that was used to wipe out the elves so long ago when they were attacked with death fog. Now, Hanag, if you ask her about teaching you to channel source, she will say that she thanks you for saving her, but that's not enough. She's actually not sure what happened to her apprentice who was last seen in the Black Pits area. She was forced to run away from the Magisters and she hasn't been able to check in on him. If you will go make sure he's alive, she will then teach you to channel more source. We were just in the Black Pits, which is why I bring this up. Getting into the Black Pits, you would have passed by an event where a family was being interrogated and possibly executed by mag Magisters. After that, you will have passed an area where a young man was being tortured on some gallows, 
right outside the cave that the Black Pits is in. So, the young man who's being tortured on the gallows is, in fact, who we need to talk to for this. He is Hanag's apprentice being interrogated by white magisters. The white magisters being, like, the leaders of the rest of the magisters. We need to basically make sure that Hanag's apprentice gets out of this situation alive. That said, that is more easily said than done, because if we start this fight with him at the top of the gallows area, a bunch of oily void woken get summoned in as soon as Hanag's apprentice uses a source ability. It will summon a ton of void woken, and then you will have to fight all those void woken. There will be fire everywhere. It's a nightmare. It, the fight itself isn't necessarily hard to win. It's keeping him alive in that fight. It's a pain. So the easiest thing to do is just teleport him away from the magisters and kind of trap him with objects like a ways away. So basically what you can do is teleport him away, make it difficult for him to try to join the fight because he will still be like aggroed into the combat. However, he'll be so far away that he won't use his source abilities summoning the Void Woken. And then if you kill the three magisters before he uses a uh, source spell, you'll be able to do the fight without the Void Woken being summoned, which makes it 10 times easier and you won't have to waste a ton of time. Now, once you talk to the apprentice after this fight, if he's still alive, he will talk about his family, which was the family being interrogated that I just mentioned a little bit earlier. And regardless of how that plays out, the apprentice goes on his way and you can then report back to Hanag. Now, if he died, Hanag is not gonna help you, period. However, if he lived, you can choose to have Hanag help you. That said, she draws her source powers from the surrounding environment. So if you choose to do this and you have the pet pal talent, it will actually go away because she kills a bunch of animals by sucking the source out of them, which is how she expanded her source powers and became a master of the source. Keep that in mind. If you learn from her, you're going to lose the pet pal talent. And that brings us to Sahela. So Sahela is the elf we met in the Fort Joy area of Act 1. She is an important elf to the elves there. So a little north of Driftwood and the Paladin's like little fort area, we can run into Sahela. Well, not Sahela specifically, but a bunch of elves. And one of them is named Tova. If you go through the dialogue appropriately without um, enraging the elves while they bury their fellow elf who died, the elf Tova will explain that Sahela, her daughter, was actually kidnapped by Roost Anlon, the lone wolves in the mill to the north. And that unfortunately, in trying to rescue her, several of their elf compatriots have died. And she'll ask you to go rescue Sahela. And we can do this. We can go up to the mill to the north. Um, there are ways to enter this area without initiating combat. However, you cannot rescue Sahela while also staying combat free. The lone wolves are the worst, and if you kill them, they'll find out, um, you'll find out rather, they have a contract out to kill any godwoken they find. They're being paid to do so by someone. And if you go talk to their leader, a guy named Roost Anlon, he will attack you because you're godwoken and he wants the bounty. However, Roost Anlon is a very important character involved in a few different of the origin quests as well as a couple other things. And he's keeping Sahela captive in that room. And you can fight him. It's not a terribly difficult fight, to be honest, as long as you're the appropriate level. You can fight him. You can free Sahela, exit her out of the camp, and guide her back to her mother's elf camp. And if you do that, Sahela will offer to help you learn how to channel more source by connecting you with nature. Which, honestly, of all the options, is probably, like, the most innocent, shall we say, way of expanding your source abilities. Now, much like Hanag's Apprentice, it is very possible for Sahela to die while you do this. And if she does, she obviously can't teach you anything because she'll be dead. So if you want to learn from her, make sure she, you know, stays alive. And that brings us to Jehan and the Advocate. Jehan and the Advocate are kind of tied together in a way but they can both teach you how to channel your source powers. Now, if you have Losa with you, Jehan is a big part of her origin character uh, story, so just keep that in mind. However, otherwise, you'll just find him in the woods, kind of near where you talk to Hanag at, like a little north and a little east of that. You'll find him in a hut with a bunch of demons in a cage, which is creepy, but Jehan will explain that He'll teach you how to channel your source powers if you go to Blood Moon Island, a demon-infested 
awful place of an island, and kill a demon named the Advocate. If you do this, Jehan will expand your source powers. Now, getting to Blood Moon Island is actually a bit of a pain, because Blood Moon Island is surrounded by death fog, which means you either need to be undead, in which case you can actually take the ferry there, because there is an undead ferryman who will ferry you across the lake to Blood Moon Island, but if you're undead, that's the only way to live through it, because if you're just a normal living person, you'll die, because it's death fog laden lake. If you're anyone else, and you're not an undead character, you have to go across the bridge, which initially seems broken, but you'll notice these little spectral walking plates that you can use. However, there are traps all along this area, and if you trigger them, the spectral walking places will disappear and you'll fall to your death in the, deck fo in the death fog. So once you've navigated that bridge and you get across the other side, you'll be greeted by three demons who don't attack you immediately, but direct you to the advocate. And if you go talk to the advocate, he doesn't try to kill you because um, that would be too easy. He's a demon, so he tries to beguile you. He will tell you two things. He'll expand your source powers right now for free if you just say you'll do something for him. You don't actually have to do it, but he'll expand your source powers right here, right now. And he does this by killing people way off. He basically takes source from someone else to give it to you and kind of teaches you about that interaction. So you can learn to channel your source powers right here through the Advocate. And the Advocate will explain that he'll do this in exchange for the promise that you'll do something. And what that something is, is going and killing the Black Ring members at the center of the Blood Moon Island. So the Black Ring is basically just a cultist group of necromancers. And if you go kill this group for the Advocate, in addition to expanding your source powers, he'll also give you the location of the Nameless Isle, which we'll get into later. But if you do that, he'll show you where it is. That said, Jehan wants you to kill the Advocate, as I mentioned earlier, which you should probably do, because he's a demon. That said, you don't have to at all. Like, there's nothing, there aren't really any negative consequences to helping the Advocate. Like, there's nothing that's gonna happen, really. If you kill the Advocate, it does have a small consequence, but even that also really doesn't matter that much. But if you kill the Advocate, you can go back to Jehan, who will then expand your source powers, like I mentioned. And then he'll have a follow-up quest for you, where he actually wants you to go learn the name of the demon that caused the problems on Blood Moon Island, which again is actually a huge part of Losa's origin character story. Just to save us some trouble, we will explore that island. You'll find out that the tree that the Black Ring members were surrounding on the middle of the island is an elven ancestor tree, which is again inhabited by a elven ancestor. But this one's been corrupted by demons, so it can't talk to anyone. And through exploration of the island, you learn that tree's name. That tree's name is Elianessa. Once you learn the tree's name, you can go speak that name to the tree, and then it'll kind of snap out of its weird fog that its mind is sort of in, and it will talk to you about what happened. And basically, that she was a badly possessed elven woman who came to the uh, Blood Moon Island, which used to be a demon research facility, shall we say, where they actively tried to cure possessions and things of that nature. However, Elianessa's case was so bad that they couldn't do anything for her. A guy named Dr. Deva was convinced he could help this woman, and in trying to help her, he actually wound up taking the demon into himself, which resulted in the complete desolation of Blood Moon Island. This demon's name is Andromalik. We bring that information back to Jehan, and he was like, I knew it! But also, no one realized that Dr. Deva was Andromalik, and uh, Dr. Deva is just like a guy in the city of Arx who's actually the demon lord Andromalik, who's been making all these deals with people to gain power. And this is where we learn, if you have Losa with you, that that is the exact demon that is taking over Losa, and that's his name. Jehan is particularly upset about this revelation because it turns out that he's actually talked to Dr. Deva a lot about demons and stuff, so that's a thing. And then... Last but not least, there is actually one more Source Master that is incredibly easy to miss. Because as far as I know, nothing tells you about the location of this woman short of happening to go where she is and finding her. This woman's name is Amira. She is a succubus who used to work for the Black Ring. You will find her in the sort of shattered part of the map in the northeast area, north of the Black Pits. If you traverse this area, which is a bit of a pain because the landscape is all over the place, but if you have the abilities like uh, wings and things that'll get you across the gaps, you can explore this area and you'll find a woman named Amira and her lover, Mahaley. 
Basically, she explains that she ran into Mihaly, she wanted to leave the Black Ring so her and Mihaly could be together, and that in leaving has become a bit of a problem because there's some sort of fog hanging over the area that is keeping wounds from healing. And she asks you to deal with this by either A, getting rid of the source of whatever's causing this fog, or escorting her and Mihaly out of the area. The easiest thing to do here is actually go clear the fog. Technically, both options work, like you, they're just two paths to the same result, basically. But the easiest thing to do is honestly just go clear out the source of the fog. So if you go north of where you find Amira and Mihaly, you'll run into a Void Woken who is intense looking. And he is causing decaying on everything around. Decaying is a status effect which prevents healing. So because of this, you need to focus him down hardcore because he, you can't heal while he's alive, because healing will actually hurt you. But once you beat this fight that clears the uh, fog of decaying, which is preventing Mahaley's wounds from healing, and if you go back to Amira, she will offer to increase your ability to channel source as well as all the others. And then Almira will actually request to join you on the Lady Vengeance and come with you on your journeys, which is cool. That is all of the Masters of Source that can potentially increase your ability to channel source as your god requested. Let's talk about what happens if you don't do that. As every single character I mentioned to increase your ability to channel source can die before they teach you how to channel source. So if that happens, you run into a bit of a fun interaction. Once it is completely impossible for you to learn to channel enough source, you will actually be visited by a war owl who will drop off a letter from Malady who explains that you messed up so bad that she had to make deals with demons to learn about the location of the Nameless Isle where you need to go next. Now, this is important because if this happens, something else happens later in the game where someone doesn't make it. Let's put it that way. I will explain that when we get to that section, but that is actually still a couple videos away, so we'll get there when we get there. But keep in mind, even if all these people die and you never learn how to channel more source, the game goes on, which I think is awesome. Let's talk about what happens if you do obviously increase your ability to channel more source. You're going to do that twice. You only need to learn to do that from two of those mini sources I just mentioned. And each time you increase it, you can go back and perform the initial ritual that you performed with Meister Siva. And the second time you do it, you'll go in, you'll talk to your god who explains that a god doesn't just see source and deal with it, they take it. And she teaches, she or he or whoever, teaches you the ability of source vampirism, which is to take source from another being, which is a useful skill. And then she sends you on your way. And the second time you do this, you will actually be teleported into your soul again like normal, but your god will actually be under attack by the void, by two creatures of the void that you'll have to help her defeat. Or him, whatever. Once you do that, the god's like, even here, I thought we were safe. We've got to move faster. Now that you've learned to channel enough source, we have to get to the Nameless Isle, like, now. So she teaches you, again, whoever your god happens to be, how to find the Nameless Isle. Basically gives you an urge to go there, which tells you where it is or something. Which is technically the end of Act 2 in a lot of ways. Like, that's the last thing you need to do before you can go to the Nameless Isle and then you can go talk to Malady on the Lady Vengeance and head off to the Nameless Isle. But like I mentioned, what if this doesn't happen? What are the other ways to learn the location of the Nameless Isle? In addition to learning to channel your source powers and speaking to your god, you can, like I mentioned earlier, learn the location of the Nameless Isle from the entity known as the Advocate. If you clear out the Black Ring from Blood Moon Island for him, he will teach you the location of the Nameless Isle so you don't have to force Malady to resort to making deals to learn that name while also not helping your god either. And the help you give the demons is inconsequential. So it's kind of like a weird neutral option. So there are three ways to find the location of the Nameless Isle. And once you do that, you can end Act 2 whenever you're ready by going back to the Lady Vengeance, talking to Malady, who will then take you to the Nameless Isle. So that's the end of Act 2 as far as the main plot goes. But as I mentioned, at the end of each video, I'm going to talk about the origin characters' plots, kind of what we learn. That's this part of the video. First up, we have Sabeel. Sabeel learned in Act 1 where the location of a guy named Roost was, which we mentioned for Sahela's part of the story. So if you bring Sabeel to Roost, 
she kills him, obviously. But before that, there's an explanation where Sabil was kidnapped after she ran away from elven society. Because if you talk to especially Sahela with Sabil, you learn that Sabil was actually what is known as the Prime Scion. Elves have these priests, let's say, called Scions. They are inheritors of knowledge of the elves. And uh, Sabil was the Prime Scion, which means when she died, she had the potential of being turned into a new mother tree. And the mother tree is what connects all of the ancestor trees that elves can turn into. Sabil knew this, hated it, because everyone treated her like this object and that's what she had to do. So she ran away from elven society. But she was tracked down by a man named Roost at the behest of another guy called the Master. She doesn't know his real name. And this is stuff you can learn from a combination of Sabil and Sahela from talking to each of them. But basically what Sabil does at the end of Act 2 is she gets uh, her revenge on Roost, explains that it feels great to get back at her kidnapper, but there's still kind of the larger plot going on with her. So that's kind of what she learns. Then we have the Red Prince. So the Red Prince left Act 1 looking for the dreamer, Brahmos, who could help him out. You find Brahmos in the Stone Garden Cemetery, but he's already dead. However, if you have spirit vision, you can talk to his spirit. Brahmos will then still do his dreamer stuff, despite being dead, with the Red Prince. And from this vision that they have, Brahmos and the Red Prince learn that the Red Princess is actually not too far away. So then we need to go track her down. She is east of where Roost is. You have to go kind of like out and around. The Red Princess and the Red Prince meet and have relations immediately because as it turns out they are both part of a prophecy that if they mate their children will reinvigorate the race of the red dragons i'm gonna level with you guys i don't like this part of the story i don't like that they tried to tie in the dragons with the lizards because that's not how this world works i'm not saying they can't fill it in to make it more make more sense but fundamentally with how they presented this it doesn't dragons have a god his name is Ouroboros. They are entirely separate race. So them trying to say that dragon, specifically red dragons, mind you, not all dragons, red dragons, devolved somehow into lizards who then have their own god, Zorostissa, but then they can turn back into dragons if the red prince and red princess mate and make more. It just doesn't make any sense with the fundamentals of how the world works. And I've always hated this bit. But that said, immediately once uh, they get their mating done, you will be attacked by the God King's forces. He will explain that uh, Sadia, the Red Princess, is actually already sworn to the God King. That's a problem. So the God King's assassins will try to kill the Red Prince, and these assassins also happen to be working for a guy named the Shadow Prince, but we'll get into more of that later. So Act 2 for the Red Prince ends with him trying to figure out what the hell is going on with... Uh, the Red Princess and her possible connection to the God King. That brings us to Ifan. So, if you talk to Ifan throughout Act 2, he'll explain that he was a soldier in the Divine's army. But not just that. Ifan was actually the guy who delivered the Death Fog to the elves. So, when the Death Fog went off and it killed all those elves, Ifan was the guy holding the proverbial fuse. He did that. It really messed him up inside. He turned into a lone wolf afterwards because he saw all that death and destruction and said, how can this be the right thing to do? Which, yeah, I mean, fair enough. So Ifan is a member of the lone wolves, the guys that Roost leads. And that situation devolves pretty quick because once uh, the lone wolves find out that Ifan is in fact a godwoken that they've been paid to kill, obviously there's a bit of a problem there. Ifan's story ends with him basically realizing the lone wolves are also awful people and you killing them. And that's kind of it for Act 2 with Ifan. From there, we have Losa. As I mentioned, Losa learns that um, the demon who is possessing her periodically is none other than Andromalik. And she does that through all of the stuff with Jahan that we found out earlier. So because of that, that's, and that, that is Losa's part for Act 2. That's everything there is to know. We also know that uh, Losa should never become divine because if she becomes divine, then the demon becomes divine by proxy because he's possessing her. So something to keep in mind there. That brings us to Fane. Fane, the undead scholar. His stuff is in Black Pits with Atira. 
all that conversation earlier with Atira when she explains that Fane discovered the veil of source that surrounded the world and how his actions basically allowed the gods to become gods and cast out the god king and the rest of the eternals to the void. So from this, we learn that the god king is the direct result of Fane's discoveries. And because of this, Fane and his family were actually banished by the god king before all that overthrowing stuff happened. And his family spent eternity, practically, in a tomb. So we learn that Fane's family paid dearly for his discoveries, and that his discoveries led inadvertently to the creation of the gods. Atira explains all of this, herself being an eternal as well. So that's what we get from Fane, and the big thing there is that Fane knows the God King personally. Fane literally knew the God King when Fane was, like, you know, not trapped for centuries. Like, the God King is somebody Fane met. And then lastly, that gives us Beast. Beast in Act 2 needs to find Lohar, which we did way towards the beginning of the video. While we're doing all that stuff with Mortis and Lohar and learning about what's going on, with Beast we find out that not only was Queen Justinia complicit in the research of that Death Fog delivery advice, that they actually stole a bunch of Death Fog from a Magister ship nearby that you can actually explore. And once Beast learns this, he knows for sure that Queen Justinia is going to use this on the Dwarven rebels who she cannot seem to get rid of. So Queen Justinia's rule is very much so threatened by a band of Dwarven rebels that she just can't seem to stomp out. And while she puts so much of the monarchy behind trying to stomp out these rebels, that she's ultimately losing power to the merchant lords. And her ultimate goal for this, because she's tired of fighting them, was to steal all this death fog from the ship that we can find in Act 2. All the death fog's gone already. It's all been stolen. Beast and Lohar will have a conversation about how obviously that needs to be stopped. Lohar gives you a bunch of information about who to talk to in arcs, and Beast needs to make his way there. So that's kind of Beast's uh, story for Act 2. He kind of learns what Justinia's endgame is and that he needs to stop it before she kills so many people. And if you remember, I know I mentioned this in Act 1, but just to remind everyone, Queen Justinia is Beast's cousin. They're, they're family. That is it, guys. That is all of Act 2 in a nutshell. Now, real quick, just a couple of other things you would have picked up throughout the Act that I think are important. We can find out that there is a distinction between the White Magisters and the Red Magisters. The White Magisters are the leaders, and they know more about what is going on with the Black Ring and the fact that the Magisters are actively forcing the Black Ring to do their bidding. They're capturing Black Ring and forcing them to work and die for the Magisters. A lot of the Red Magisters aren't aware of the higher-up goings-on. And the Paladins that we can meet in Act 2 are learning that the Magisters are working with the Black Ring in a lot of cases. And obviously, that's a problem for the Paladins, as they are the members of the Divine Order, and they hate the Black Ring by, you know, for their very existence. That was the entire point of Divine Divinity, which is about 20 years ago in the timeline of this particular game. Just a couple quick things there I wanted to mention, because they'll be important later. So... There you go, guys. Act 2. I hope you enjoyed it. This was a ton of effort for me. It was a very it was one of the longer videos that I've put together that wasn't actually just a collection of other videos. But thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom. Hit that like, comment, subscribe button to help me out with that YouTube algorithm. And have an amazing day. Fantastic. Now, on to the interesting part. After many adventures, the party finally reached the place where Godwoke can go to become divine. But more surprises and difficult choices awaited. What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you episode 3 of our Divinity Original Sin 2 story series. Now, just as a reminder, I am only focusing on the main plot, really. We are covering some side quests as they come up, but they're not the main focus. The origin characters and what they learn in Act 3, I will cover at the end of the video for all six of them, despite not playing with all six of them. 
And with that out of the way, let's jump straight into it. So we have arrived at the Nameless Isle after expanding our source powers in Act 2, as well as learning the location of the Nameless Isle itself. Now our goal here is to find the Well of Ascension that our appropriate god told us about. The Well of Ascension being a lake of source in the Nameless Isle that we need to devour, basically, to become the next divine. So that's our goal in Act 3. Find and consume the Well of Ascension. Now when we arrive on the Lady Vengeance, depending on which characters are with us and still alive, they can give us some advice. Now Gareth, if he is still with you, heads out to the island to see what the uh, Paladins and Seekers are doing here. The Paladins and the Magisters, sorry. If Tarquin is still with you and alive, he tells you the phrase of the Lone Wolves that may help you if you run into any of the Black Ring here. If Almira is still with you, she teaches you a phrase and basically says that if you use this, the Black Ring will think you are her thrall, as she used to be a Black Ring member. And that's pretty much it. So any of these characters that are still alive will kind of help you out and give you some guidance and things that you can do extra if they are still alive and with you. So Act 3 is honestly a bit more freeform than the previous two acts. And I mean this simply because there's not really a lot of level restrictions in Act 3. The actual level span of the island is like 15 to 17, so it is very likely that you will be able to do everything here pretty much regardless of the level you are when you encounter it. Which is very different from the previous two acts where it was possible to go into places that were vastly uh, over leveled compared to you. And the result of that is that Act 3 is very accessible. So you can do pretty much anything in any order. So I'm going to do my best to make all of that make sense, but you know, if you're actually playing this, you can kind of do any of this just whenever. With that in mind, basically we need to find our way into the Academy, which I believe is supposed to represent the Council of Seven place that was mentioned in the original Divine Divinity. It seems to perform the same function at least. So I think it might be intended to be the same building like outright, but that's just conjecture really. In order to get into the Academy, we need to solve a puzzle that is guarding the door. Upon your first visit, you might not understand what you need to do to solve that puzzle. Like it's actually a little vague and there's nothing at the door that's really going to explain it to you. And even if you do solve the puzzle itself, you actually need a secondary item, which again, you may not know about if it's your first time playing the game. There are a couple ways you can learn how to solve this puzzle if you can't just figure it out yourself. And as we can learn from finding him, we can run into Alexander, who is actually still alive, despite having potentially killed him twice up to this point, which is, you know, annoying, but here we are. We can also run into another entity called the Sallow Man, who is working for the Black Ring. These two people are important in this moment because they can teach you how to solve the puzzle that guards the way into the Academy itself. And basically, what both of them want is very simple. They both want you to kill the other one. Alexander wants you to kill the Sallow Man, and the Sallow Man wants you to kill Alexander. Pretty straightforward. And you can totally do either one of these. You don't have to help them if you know how to solve the puzzle. If you don't know how, you can help literally either of them, and they'll then give you the answer of how to get into the Academy. Now, in talking to Alexander and the Sallow Man, we are actually going to learn a couple of things regardless of whether or not we help them. So with Alexander, when you run into him for the first time, if Gareth is still alive, there will be an encounter between Gareth and Alexander that you can resolve or watch play out and not involve yourself with at all. But personally, I recommend saving Gareth because why not? But that said, either way, Alexander will explain that he's been being played for a fool. When he woke from the Hall of Echoes after your last encounter with him right before the beginning of Act 2, he had come to the realization in the Hall of Echoes that Dallas had been playing him for a fool and actively hindering him from becoming the Divine, which is why he hadn't gotten there yet. And that Vredeman, the person who was supposed to be helping him and tutoring him, was actually actively hindering his progress. And Alexander, with this new information fresh from the Hall of Echoes, confronts Dallas and Vredeman about this and they tried to kill him. So Alexander, managing to escape that situation, took the remaining paladins and magisters that were loyal to him and he fled to the Nameless Isle where he's going to try to claim divinity for himself now that he knows about it. So right there, Dallas and Alexander are no longer on the same team 
which is very important. Now what we'll learn from the Sallow Man, if you haven't figured this out already, which it is kind of possible to do before you get to the Sallow Man, but this is like the best place to talk about it. The Sallow Man serves what is known as the God King. Now we've heard references of the God King up to this point from say Zalaskar and Windigo in the first act, as well as a couple people in act two will refer to him. But basically the God King is the de facto leader of the Void at the moment. However, it's important to understand that the God King is serving the Void. He's not like the head honcho of the Void. He's not like their main guy. He serves the Void. The Void existed long before the God King did because the God King was the leader of the race of Eternals before he was casted out by the seven gods. In his desperation to get back into Rivalon, the God King and the Eternals turned to the Void for help. And that's how that relationship started. So the God King is just an insanely powerful guy that serves the void. But what the God King does is he makes what's called covenants with people. And basically they vow to serve the God King in life and death. And what they get out of that is immortality and power. And the only thing that can break the covenant is an item called the Sworn Breaker. Now this is important because if you are here with Almira, if she made it to Act 3 with you, she would like a Sworn Breaker because she made a covenant to the God King. Now the catch is, there are more than one person who needs the Sworn Breaker to break their covenant. There's actually potentially up to four. Likely only three, but potentially up to four. But we'll get to that in a minute. The only one we know of right now is Almira. And the tablet that we helped Riker get as part of Act 2 is actually the tablet that has the recipe for how to make a Sworn Breaker. Now the pieces to fulfill that recipe are on the Nameless Isle. Now the catch is, there are only two Sworn Breakers in the entire game. There's the one you can craft here on the Nameless Isle, and there is a second one in the next act of the game. But like I said, there's only two Sworn Breakers, and there's a minimum of three people who could use a Sworn Breaker. So that's important. Now right now, Almira is the only person that we know of, like I said, so if you get the Sworn Breaker here, I actually do recommend giving it to Almira. It's totally fine. But with all of that out of the way, regardless of who we choose to help, Alexander or the Salaman will explain that the way to solve the puzzle is pretty simple. Each god is associated with either the sun or the moon and you need to go to the puzzle in front of the door and put the rune that corresponds with each god in the appropriate place. So basically, there are statues of the gods around. They will either have a sun or the moon symbol above them and you need to match the appropriate symbols above the appropriate god. But they also explain that that in and of itself is not enough. You actually need to then find a power source for the gate switch to power the gate switch and then while all those runes are in the appropriate place, flip the said switch and that will open the academy. Now what Alexander and the Salaman won't tell you is which god is associated with which item, the sun or the moon. In order to learn that information, we need to go around to the seven altars to the gods that are around the Nameless Isle and figure it out. Or alternatively, you could in theory just guess. But basically all seven gods have an altar on the island. We need to go pray at said altar to try to find out which sun or moon that they are associated with. So. With that in mind, starting with Amadia. Amadia's tower is actually to the western portion of the map that is covered in lava, and you need to use skills to get over there. Climb the tower, which brings you to a small sub-map in which you need to solve a series of short puzzles that are pretty easy to solve, to be honest, until you get to her altar. Now at her altar, you're going to talk to the Knight of Amadia which is an important character because I don't think they get enough screen time. There are several knights of so-and-so on the Nameless Isle. These knights are actually Godwoken. They are Godwoken who are strong enough to not fail at the trials, but not strong enough to actually succeed either. So they're Godwoken that are kind of stuck, and they usually are referred to as the knights of appropriate god. And I think they're really cool because they are inherently strong characters. They're just not quite strong enough to grab divinity. And as such, they tend to guard the appropriate altar of their god. The Knights of Amadia, the Knight of Amadia, is one of those people. So if you're nice to her and explain that you just want to pray to Amadia, you can do so. Now this is where it gets a little interesting when you actually start praying at these altars because if you are praying at an altar that is not for the character you are praying to it with, there will be a consequence. If you are praying at the altar of Rollick and you are not a human, he will demand that you be blinded. Or alternatively, you can ask your god for help. 
Now, if you ask your God for help when you're praying at one of these altars, the God will take care of the dialogue scenario, and then you will get the appropriate information about which rune they belong to without having to take on said consequence. Now, most of these consequences, there are ways around. You can cure them. Some of them are more of a big deal than others, like Rolex sets blind and you have to go through a bit of a hassle to get that off of you. So the best thing to do is try your best to use the appropriate character to pray at the appropriate altar. Amadia's is actually one of the easiest. She just asks for some source from you. Or if you're playing an undead character or something, you can just you know pray with them and then they'll take care of it and you will learn that Amadia is beholden to the sun. Now that brings us to Rollick. Rollick is probably the first altar you'll find because it is in the center of the map and there's a big fight going on around it. You need to resolve this fight either by killing everybody or siding with the Black Ring or the Paladins and then you'll be able to talk to the altar. Same thing as before, you'll find out that Rollick is beholden to the sun as well and then you can move on. And that brings us to Xantessa. So Xantessa is the god of the imps. So if you go to where her altar is supposed to be, you'll find that it's not there. But it is slightly north of uh, where Rollick's altar is. But what you can find is a knight of Xantessa on the ground lying dead. So if you search that body, you can find a book and it'll explain that imps like to make pocket realms, which is a thing before this game even showed up. But they had a lot of fun with it here. Near the puzzle at the gates of the academy, you can find two wolves fighting over a big gym. The big gym is the pocket realm for the imps. You need to deal with these wolves either non-violently or violently, and then take a hold of the imps pocket realm so you can travel inside of it. Now, this is a big puzzle area that there are a bunch of traps and stuff you're supposed to solve, but they did also include a back way. If you turn around when you first enter the realm, you can use a skill to jump to the pipes and completely skip all of that and jump right to the end, which I highly recommend you do. Most of these traps are instant death. So once you get to the last platform, you need to quickly click on the orb in the center of the room to deactivate the traps before it gets flooded with lava and you die. Now once this is done, Zantessa will pop up and she doesn't require anything of you actually. She just flatly tells you that she's associated with the moon because imps are logical and she knows that if she doesn't help you, the gods might very seriously die as we learned in act two. So she's not playing any games until she decides to play some games. So <laughs> Zantessa will ask you just for fun to denounce your god, which has uh, the consequence of annoying the god that's inhabiting your soul at the moment, which has its own problems, but you don't have to. She'll tell you that she's part of the moon and you can be like, nah, I'm not gonna mess with all that and just be on your way. That brings us to Vrogir. Vrogir is probably the most involved altar to get to because his temple has actually been sunken underneath water. We need to go north slightly from his temple to find a camp of Black Ring members who are actively using portal magic to transfer water from the sea to Vrogir's temple to, of course, flood it, and we need to kill them so that stops. Once that's done, the water will go down, we can enter Vrogir's temple, we can go to the altar and we can pray to it, and we'll find out that Vrogir is associated with the sun. Which brings us to Zorostissa, the lizard goddess. She's actually, again, one that is pretty easy to find. She's just out in the open world here. We just need to go to the far south part of the map, find her altar, pray to it with a lizard or vice, or some of the other options that I've mentioned, and we'll find out that Zorostissa is beholden to the sun. And that brings us to Duna. Not too far from Zorostissa's altar is where Duna's is. Now, Duna's, you'll need a skill to get to the entrance because there's a big gap around it. You'll have to jump over there somehow. And Duna's temple is filled with some interesting traps, but more importantly, if you get close to these statues that are all over the place in here, they will hit you for a lot of damage, and they are not in the normal combat sequence. They'll just hit you all the time outside of the normal combat round. So if you're in combat and getting hit by these statues, that character is going to die pretty fast. But basically, inside of Duna's temple, her knight, the knight of Duna, has been corrupted by the void and we need to put him down. So we kill him, then we can pray at the altar of Duna and you'll find out that Duna is associated with the moon. And that leaves Tyrsindilius. So Tyrsindilius is where Alexander has been holed up this whole time. So if you found Alexander, you know where he is. And Tyrsindilius also has the biggest temple on the island and it's very naturey. It's very easy to find. If you go to Tyrsindilius's altar, pray with an elf or Sibyl or somebody, you'll find out that Tyrsindilius is associated with the moon. 
and congratulations. Now you have all of the runes that you need to open the door. Now the power source you can find in a variety of places. There are caves over the island that usually have them. If you go to anywhere, basically, on the island, you can find one of these power sources. There's tons of them. You can find way more than you need. You just need one of them. It's like a phase capacitor, I think is the actual name. So once that's done, you need to go back to the puzzle gateway to the academy. You need to set the, all the statues of the gods to their appropriate rune. You need to put the phase capacitor on the switch. You need to flip said switch, which will then open the academy. Now this is the moment that I'm going to mention. You can skip literally all of this that I just mentioned. You don't have to do any of this. If you go to Zoral Stissa's altar and then go north, there's gonna be a cracked ground with uh, lava flows and stuff going through it. If you have the skills necessary to navigate that area, you can actually make your way to the northernmost part of that platform area and find a secret tunnel that leads into the academy without you having to solve or deal with that puzzle literally at all. But regardless of which of those options you choose, once you get inside the academy and it's clear that this is kind of the moment of no return, your party is going to have a bit of a powwow. They're going to be like, hey, one of us needs to become divine. We should probably sort out which one of us that that's going to be. If you've been good to your companions and you've talked to them regularly, or you have a very high persuasion check, you can persuade all of them to side with you personally to basically support your personal claim to divinity. Or you can fail this and they'll leave your group. But that said, it's pretty easy to convince them to help you out, so it really shouldn't be too much of an issue. Once we are inside the academy, before we actually get into the academy proper, we enter a little lobby area if we came in through the main gate. This is where you will run into a void woken creature. If you have Fane with you, this is an important origin conversation. However, if you have everybody else, the creature calls you a thief and explains that the void woken were the inhabitants of Rivalon first, that they are actually the eternal race that has been cast out and turned to void woken because they were forced to, because when the seven gods tossed them out of Rivalon, they didn't have anywhere to go. They were stuck in the void. So the Void Woken are just trying to get back into Rivalon, and that's why they've been attacking people who use Source, because the more Source disappears, the more cracks there are in the veil, so to speak, and the Void Woken can keep slipping in. Now this conversation does change a little bit if you have Fane with you, because this guy actually offers Fane the chance to rejoin his people as a covenant to the God King, which you can accept, and then Fane will learn the curse skill, which is awesome that it's an option, to be honest, it's so out there. Now, once we're in the academy proper, we will find a deactivated construct, and if we have a phase capacitor to put in him, he will awaken and he will be the Seneschal, and he'll explain what we need to do in the academy. And basically all we need to do is get the gate ahead of you down to the entrance to the Well of Ascension, where a separate construct will begin the appropriate battle to become the divine. While you're powering up that gate, you should actually explore a little bit because you'll find a bunch of dead bodies and spirits roaming around, as well as two big tablets in the library room. So if you completed act two without ever speaking to the God that is inhabiting your soul, and you killed all of the source masters and never expanded your source, you will have likely missed the spirit vision and source vampirism skills. However, if you've gotten this far without learning those, you can read these two tablets in the academy to then learn those skills so you don't have to go without them anymore, which is just a nice little touch. Now, if we talk to some of these spirits that are inhabiting the library and the academy proper, we can learn that some of them were killed by none other than Lucian the Divine. So Lucian the Divine, who has been dead for a while, before he died, had apparently been killing Godwoken in the academy to ensure, as it is kind of implied to us at the moment, that his son Alexander takes up the mantle of divine instead of anyone else. Spoiler alert, that is not the whole truth, but that is kind of how it is presented to us in the moment. But what we can learn is that Lucian the Divine has been doing heinous acts for some unexplained reason as of right now. He definitely killed some of these people in the academy, which is a huge lore reveal because he's like, uh, this guy's supposed to be like the divine light incarnate. And before he died, he was murdering innocent people. That's something. Now, from there, 
Inside the Academy library area, we can put a phase capacitor down to light up a power source, and then we can navigate that power source to the gate that leads to the arena where we can reach the Well of Ascension. Now, once we power that gate down, we can go through it and find that the origin characters who we did not make part of our party, as well as Alexander, can be found in this room. If we talk to them, which we will have a chance to do, we find out that any origin characters that died on the way to Act 2 made a covenant with the God King, and they now serve him, and they're here to claim divinity. We can also speak to Bishop Alexander, as he will be here as well, if you haven't already killed him at Tyrus and Delius's temple. And he can actually be convinced to help you. He can uh, be persuaded to see, basically, that he's never going to be the real divine, and that he should help you ascend to divinity instead. So there's that. Or, alternatively, he's just another competitor. Now, when you're ready, you need to talk to the construct in the area to lead everyone to the arena of the divine. So once you accept this option, all of you guys are arranged at the end of basically a linear path. There are constructs down the path that serve to hinder you. And keep in mind, most of the people set on this linear path towards the starting line are in fact not your friends besides your party. Some of your own party members might even be against you if you failed the persuasion check when you entered the academy. There's a lot of variables to this fight, so I can't really cover all of them, but you get the gist. Now what you need to do here is simply reach the Well of Ascension before any hostile characters do. Pretty straightforward. Um, you can actually do this in one turn with a character who's built properly, as you can see me do here. You get to the Well. You're ready to ascend to Divinity, as you have been tirelessly trying to do. And then none other than Dallas shows up to ruin your parade. Because of course she does. So, Dallas, as I mentioned in Act 2, had found the Atiran. The Atiran is a wand that can devour infinite amounts of source, literally any amount. Dallas quickly interrupts before you get a chance to devour the source yourself. If Bishop Alexander is still alive at this point, if you haven't killed him on the island, because again, even if you killed him prior to Act 3, he will still be on the island when you get there. But if you've killed him on the island, he doesn't do this part. But if he is still here, he confronts Dallas where Dallas finally kills him permanently. This is important because there is no outcome of this game where Alexander lives, which makes sense because Divinity 2 takes place 60 years after this game, and there's no hide nor hair ever mentioned of Alexander. So this is canonically the place where Alexander dies. Now, after that is done, Dallas taunts you a bunch, and her and Vredeman, her sidekick, consume all of the source in the Well of Ascension into the Atiran, and they run away, and everyone else is knocked out. You come to in an academy that is quickly falling apart, and you need to get out. However, before you have a chance to do that, the god inside your soul angrily calls you a failure and demands that you give her or him or it your power back. Obviously, this doesn't really work. You can actually, by the way, just be like, yeah, all right, here you go. It, it just gives you a game over. It's just, it's so funny that they added that, but it doesn't actually do anything. You do have to resist to actually carry on with the game and be like, no, I'm totally not going to do that. All of the gods inside all of your origin characters that are with you will pop out and try to kill you. So you basically failed in their eyes and they want to basically move on to try to do something else before the situation gets any worse. So here's the thing. Once you kill all of the regular avatars, one of them will basically like supernova into a source titan which is like their last ditch effort to live and your team will kill the source titan this is huge because you've effectively killed the last gods of rivalon not all of the gods mind you but the last of the seven shall we say keep in mind like the gods are literally dying in this fight this is what happens the seven lords that have been there through the lore they're they're dead as of this moment once that's done, Malady calls to you, and she puts a beacon to the Lady Vengeance down at the end of this arena, and you need to get to it without dying. Once you kill the Source Titan, combat continues, and there's lava that periodically spawns in, so you have to avoid that and get to the beacon where Malady can pull you out. That is where we are going to leave the Act 3 story. Act 4 will be where we pick up where we were just teleported to onto the Lady Vengeance and carry into Arcs, which is where we're going next. 
As I mentioned at the start of the video, we are going to cover the origin story characters and kind of what they learned in Act 3. So, not a ton, just as a spoiler alert. Um, act 3 is kind of short, especially compared to all of the other acts. It's fairly linear, almost, in some ways. And it's overall the smallest act of the game by far. So, with that in mind, let's start with Sabeel. So, Sabeel is probably the only one with a ton going on in the Nameless Isle area as far as her story goes, because Sabeel's story actually resolves right here, unless you're playing her. If you're playing her, obviously, she'll go on to become, like, maybe become the Divine. If you just have Sabeel in your party, her story ends here as far as actually completing it goes. So, Sabeel will run into the Master here, the guy who had her enslaved for so long before she escaped prior to the events of the game. Now, the Master turns out to be none other than the Prince of Shadows, who is on the island. The Prince of Shadows is, technically, the entire House of Shadows, which is a subsection of the ancient Lizard Empire. Now, if you've talked to Sabeel throughout the game and you have a good reputation with her, she will potentially talk to you and give you the song that controls her slave mark. So when she goes to fight the Master and he goes to control her using the slave mark on her cheek, that you can step in and sing the song and say no, so Sabeel can fight. One way or the other, you definitely need to kill the Shadow Prince, the Master, which is pretty easy to do. However, you can also talk to him because the Shadow Prince is tied heavily in with the Red Prince's story as well. So, the other half of Sabeel's story is that she is the Prime Scion, which we covered at the end of Act 2. As the Prime Scion, she has the potential to be the Mother Tree. Well, fun fact, the Mother Tree that exists right now is actually also on the island. And if we go to Tyr Sindelius' shrine, and if Sahela is still alive, we can go to where the Mother Tree is supposed to be. Sahela will beg us to kill the Mother Tree. She'll be like, please, for the love of God, kill her. Because the Mother Tree is a tyrannical leader who controls the thoughts and afterlives of all the elves, basically. The Shadow Prince, if you talk to him, actually wants to destroy the Mother Tree because prior to the events of 1233, where the elves were wiped out by all the death fog that was used by Lucian's army, the ancestor trees had actually been growing rapidly and actually had a plan for world domination. That part is true. The Shadow Prince is definitely a bad dude who's working for the Black Ring in some cases, Nonetheless, he did get that part right. The Mother Tree was absolutely trying to do that. The Shadow Prince would like you to kill the Mother Tree and gives you one way to do that. It's not the only way, but it can be done through the Shadow Prince, who will give you a Death Fog explosive barrel that you can place at the heart of the Mother Tree, which will cause a fight with the Mother Tree's guardians. And then you can go back to the Shadow Prince, have him detonate it, and kill the Mother Tree that way. However, you don't need to do that. It's one way to do it. But if you have Sabeel with you, and you've already killed the Shadow Prince, you can then go and fight the protectors of the Mother Tree, have a conversation with Sabeel about whether or not she wants to become the Mother Tree, by the way, before you uh, kill the Guardians, that is, when you first step in to see the Mother Tree. They'll be like, hey, the Mother Tree's dying. All that death fog that wiped out our people had a huge adverse effect on the Mother Tree. She's dying. And as the Prime Scion, it's Sabeel's responsibility to step in and become the new Mother Tree. Problem with this is Sabeel, as a person, probably doesn't want to do that. As a character, you can choose what you want Sabeel to do. You can kind of nudge her in one direction or the other to either make her the Mother Tree or kill the Mother Tree. If we didn't use the Shadow Prince's option to kill him and we go there with Sabeel, kill the guards, we can then choose to interact with the Mother Tree and let Sabeel kill it. So, the best outcome for Sabeel's story, since it does end right here technically, I would say is freeing her of all these people who kept trying to enslave her. Now, this is a personal opinion. You can resolve this story however you want. Sabeel has been literally a slave to the Master. She has been figuratively a slave to the Mother Tree and her people. And I think the only appropriate thing to do, really, is set this poor woman free. So, kill the Shadow Prince, because he's the worst. Then kill the Mother Tree, because she's literally a tyrannical tree with plans for world domination. And set Sabeel free. And that's the end of her personal origin story. It can resolve other ways. She can become the Mother Tree. You can let the Mother Tree live and only kill the Shadow Prince. You can kill neither of them. 
and carry on, though Sabil won't appreciate that at all. There you go, that is Sabil's origin story in a nutshell. Now that brings us to the Red Prince. As I mentioned, he is also tied in with the Shadow Prince. Now, the Shadow Prince sent assassins after the Red Prince after he had mated with Sadia, the Red Princess, to, in theory, make new Great Red Dragons that had disappeared from the world. Now, the Red Prince will learn from this conversation with the Shadow Prince that Sadia has went somewhere to Arcs. You don't know where in Arcs, but somewhere in Arcs. And more than likely, the Red Prince will trigger a fight with the Shadow Prince. Not all the time, but like 9 out of 10, the Shadow Prince is going to die because he's an awful dude. And I highly recommend you kill him. So the Shadow Prince's whole deal is like he's trying to protect the ancient lizard empire from threats unseen. But the problem is he keeps doing arguably worse shit to protect them from it. So he wants to stop the mother tree from spreading so he enslaves an elf girl to kill other scions which is what he had Sabil doing so he can stop her but like you could literally just tell people that this tree is crazy it doesn't make any sense what he's doing why would you not just be like hey there's a tyrannical tree ancestor tree who would like to enslave the world maybe we should do something about that guys his whole back road approach just doesn't make sense to me and then secondly the shadow prince wants to assassinate the red prince because he doesn't want dragons being made and thus, you know, perhaps causing the ancient lizard empire a problem. But again, that's just presumptions. The Shadow Prince doesn't know that'll happen. He doesn't know anything about what's going on in that particular regard. He just wants to do it because I think he wants control over the situation, personally. Now that said, Shadow Prince should totally die as far as I'm concerned, but I don't think you technically have to, as far as I know. But that is the Red Prince out of the way. So Losa does not have basically anything at all to say in Act 3. She learns nothing and does nothing. She's actually silent because she's fighting Andrama Leak so hard that she literally barely speaks on the Nameless Isle at all. We've already learned where the demon possessing her is, which is, of course, the city of Arks, where he is posing as Dr. Deva. And that's pretty much all there is for her. Very similar situation with Beast. Beast already knows he needs to make his way to Arks so he can stop whatever plot Queen Justinia has planned for all that death fog she stole and had shipped to Arks. So Beast doesn't have a lot going on here either other than trying to claim divinity but getting stopped like everyone else. Fane does have a little bit going on. As I mentioned, as you enter the Academy, there is that conversation with that Voidwoken uh, emissary that you can have. And, factually, Fane can choose to join the Godwoken and rejoin his eternal brethren. You can do this as a character, even. It won't, like, hold anything up. You can just keep going. You will learn the curse skill. If you choose to break this covenant, which, you know, you might not want to be enslaved to a cosmic entity at some point... So you'll need a Sworn Breaker in the future to break that covenant. If you choose to do this, I don't recommend doing it, but, you know, the option's there. And lastly, that brings to us to Ifan. So Ifan doesn't necessarily learn anything new, because a lot of his character development kind of happened in Act 2. But he does have things to say to Alexander about his father. He does have uh, a lot to say about Alexander straight-up killing people in the Academy of the Seven. So he's basically just confused. He's like, what in the world has Lucian been doing killing all these people? And that's pretty much where he's at mentally. There's not a ton going on with him at the moment. So there you go, guys. Um, there is a recap of the story of Divinity Original Sin 2 Act 3, as well as what some of the origin characters learn briefly, kind of broad overview, towards the end of the video there. So thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you our final episode of the story of Divinity Original Sin 2. So some caveats, if you somehow landed on the final part very first, we are just covering the main plot. I will discuss the origin character stories, but towards the end of the video, not quite the end of the video for this episode, like I have been doing, 
because I would like to address the origin characters before we get to the final fight of the final act. So we'll talk about, we'll kind of take a small interjection towards the end there and talk about those at that time, which I feel makes more sense than doing it at the literal end after most of those stories will have concluded with the final boss fight. So that out of the way, not covering a ton of the side quests. Arcs is a super fun act. I actually really enjoy Arcs a ton. Now when the game launched, Arcs was not in such a great state compared to the rest of the game. However, the Definitive Edition and some patches fixed pretty much all of that. They really fleshed out Arcs, added a lot of meat to the bones. So it is a much better act than it used to be. It's actually my favorite one now. It used to be the first act until they fixed Arcs, and then Arcs is now a super fun place to be. But all that out of the way, at the end of the third episode, we had just gotten pulled out of the Academy from the Nameless Isle. After Malady saved us from that, she brought us onto a ship as the Nameless Isle was destroyed in the Hall of Echoes, Our Lady Vengeance. This is where we will pick up. Malady has just taken us back. She is obviously very disappointed that Divinity was stolen from us at the end of Act 3, and now we need to track Dallas down and figure that out. Malady needs a little rest before she can pull us out of the Hall of Echoes, so you are invited to talk to your companions. You actually can't explore the ship in this particular part. You can go talk to your companions. They all have some fun things to say, but the main gist of this conversation is that if you've romanced any of them, or you have a high enough affinity with any of them, you can have some fun below decks before carrying on, and that's all we'll say about that. Now, when that scene wraps up, or you just choose to go to the front of the ship and carry on when you're ready, you can talk to Malady, who will then pull you out of the Hall of Echoes, but unfortunately, it doesn't quite go as planned. After the briefest moment of respite, Malady brought the Godwoken to Arx to recover the divine powers Dallas had snatched away. But the half-demon's secret was taking its toll on her. Ah! Ah, Lucian! The boss is going to ruin everything! Freeze! 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 And you crash the Lady Vengeance just outside of Arcs in the outskirts. Malady manages to pull off a pretty big feat. While the physical ship was destroyed in Arcs, she does manage to keep part of it alive in the Hall of Echoes. So if you still need any of the services found on the uh, Lady Vengeance, you can find them still. You just have to use the waypoints to access it versus like physically going to the ship. Now, this is the part where we learn how much of a toll it takes on Malady to pull us in and out of the Hall of Echoes like she has been doing, which has been alluded to throughout the game up to this point, but this is the part where we really notice because it takes a huge toll on her. So, here's the thing. If you messed up, so to speak, I mean, or made the conscious decision, in Act 2 to not learn any source, like any source expanding powers from any of the Source Masters in Act 2, and Malady had to make deals with demons to find out the location of the Nameless Isle, then this particular jump to Arcs will kill Malady if she had to do that in Act 2. So, this is, as far as I know, the only real instance where Malady dies. And, if she dies, that affects Losa's origin story, because Malady plays a very important role in that a little farther on, but Malady dying most directly affects Losa's origin story. We know for a fact Malady's death right here is not canon. So a lot of the events in Divinity Original Sin 2 are questionable, but if Malady dies right here, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that is not canon. Because she is in Divinity Fallen Heroes, which was in production, which was scrapped. So unless they decide to completely scrap that game, which is technically just on halt right now, we know Malady survives this particular instance. We can talk to any survivors we have left. Um, if you have Tarquin with you still, or Gareth, say, or maybe Almira even. Almira is in the Hall of Echoes, Lady Vengeance. She won't actually be in the physical world right here. But if any of those characters are still alive, you can absolutely talk to them and everything. None of them have a ton of important stuff to say right now. Mostly they're just like, go on and get out there, man. Find Divinity. When we leave the ship that has crashed area, we can find a cliff overlook and we can see that the Kraken from the very start of the game has attacked the harbor of Arcs and has actually destroyed the Lord Dread, Dallas's other ship and the companionship, shall we say, to the Lady Vengeance. 
basically a male version of the same ship known as the Lord Dread. Now, if we climb down the path here, we can get stopped by an elf who explains that Arx is under attack by Voidwoken and that all sorts of crazy stuff is going on. But none of that's really important. So the outskirts has some merchants and stuff if you need it that you can buy some supplies from, but mostly you want to head towards the harbor and try to take care of this Kraken situation. So the Kraken. I hate the Kraken. God, I hate this fight. I hate it so, so very much. Like a lot of stuff, there are ways to cheese it, I'm well aware. With the party composition that I usually run, that I usually have the most fun with, this fight is a nightmare and I hate it. You'll fight the Kraken, there's like these five little tentacles which are what you actually have to kill. You cannot kill like the main body of the Kraken. You need to attack the little tentacles of the Kraken and the Kraken will like just go away. The problem is that the Kraken head will shoot these uh, high damage water blasts every turn that more often than not freeze. Uh, whoever happens to be hit by them, as well as summoning Void Woken monsters who will also attack and freeze your characters. So basically, you need to really, really avoid the frozen status effect. What I actually recommend doing is if you can, sneak up, teleport the main Void Woken enemies, like the ones that aren't the Kraken and thus can move, ac like actually move around. Teleport those guys up and out of the way and dispose of them like one by one as opposed to trying to fight them all at once which will let you set up to attack the Kraken better. And from here, the Kraken will actually summon more uh, every once in a while, so I find it best to kill half of the tentacles, retreat, come around the other side of the harbor so you can better tactically position your people to attack the other tentacles without it taking like three turns to move sides, and then kill those tentacles in a separate combat sequence, shall we say. Probably more information than you needed for a story video, but there you go. I hate that fight. That's how I personally deal with it. Now, once that's done, we can find our way up to the shattered remains of the Lord Dread. And the main thing we want to do here is actually talk to the Lord Dread, because like the Lady Vengeance, uh, the Lord Dread is actually a live wood ship, which means it has a sentience attached to it. So if we talk to the Lord Dread, we can be like, hey man, where'd Dallas go? And he's like, well, I hate being a ship like the Lady Vengeance, so here, let me tell you. We find out that Dallas went into Arks, obviously, towards the Magister Barracks in town. Also, in addition to this, the Lord Dread mentions that Dallas and her sidekick, Riedemann, who's still kicking around, are incredibly old. And you can be like, what? They're not that old. Dallas is like a young woman. And then the Lord Dread is like, nah, man, I'm an ancestor tree who was cut down and turned into a ship. I'm super old, but they're even older than I am. They're old. And you're like, all right, that's weird. Carrying on. Now we need to get into town because that's really all there is to do on the outskirts as far as the main story goes. There is other stuff, but it's not important in the main story. In order to get into town, we need to cross a bridge that is actively under attack by Voidwoken. They are fighting some paladins on the bridge. This is a tough fight, but not nearly as bad as the Kraken, in my opinion. So on higher difficulties, I find it incredibly difficult to keep any of the Paladins alive, but it does not really matter if they die here. None of the ones on the bridge are super important. So if they all die to the Void Woken, like, don't worry about it too much. It doesn't make much of a difference. Now, the main boss in this fight is like this uh, super roided out vampiric Void Woken. This guy, if he hits you, will almost always heal to full health if he hits your vitality because he has a ton of points in Necromancer. So because of that, you really need to lock the, I think Blood Fury is its name offhand. You need to lock it down where it's not taking any turns because it will do massive damage and it will heal itself every time. So you really need to like stun this thing into the ground until you can kill it. But I actually recommend killing it last, which is annoying, but you know, try to take turns away from it while killing everything else because it will summon in a ton, a ton of other Void Woken in waves. So every time you think you're done, here comes some more. So it's an annoying fight to be sure, but again, in my opinion, not nearly as bad as the Kraken. After this happens, we will be uh, greeted, shall we say, by another paladin who runs in to the area from the actual town portion of the city. So she'll run onto the bridge leading into Arks and she'll be like, hey, thanks for killing all these Voidwoken. And more importantly, she will also explain that the Paladins are straight up at war with the Magisters because Lord Kim, possibly because of you, if you completed a few side quests in Act 2, but regardless of whether or not you did that, this still happens. 
the paladins are now at war with the magisters because they found out about their black ring connections because if you remember in act two we found out the magisters were using the black ring to accomplish goals thanks to none other than dallas and co as we learned from alexander before his untimely death and then dallas herself at the end of act three now once we get in town after absorbing all that information we went ahead basically due right to the Magister's barracks, and when we get there, we're going to come up on a execution. So Lord Kim, the commander of the Paladins, which we will have learned his name more than likely by now, but if you haven't, Lord Kim, commander of the Paladins. He executes a Paladin for failing to take up arms against the Magisters, which might seem excessive in some ways. On both ends, you might on one hand be like, why didn't this Paladin want to fight the Magisters? Like, did she just think it was wrong or what? And you might be like, seems like an extreme reaction of Kim to execute this paladin for not killing people. But you can choose to intervene and help try to save the paladin, or you can just watch it happen, be a bystander. Choose whatever you want. It doesn't make much of a difference. Now, after this, you want to talk to Lord Kim if you didn't, you know, like start a fight with him and explain that you're looking for Dallas, the, you know, leader of the Magisters, basically, at this point. He can be like, great, so are we. So he'll explain that, you know, the Paladins found out again about these Black Ring connections and that they would also very much so like to know where Dallas is. We are invited to basically help the search or you can convince Kim to help you search, however you want to word it. There is a hatch to the basement in the kitchen area of the Magister's Barracks. Now there is a note on a body just outside in the courtyard of the Magister's Barracks and that note will kind of give some passcodes and then you take those passcodes to the hatch in the basement and you put them in a dial thing through dialogue in the correct order, which if I'm not mistaken is literally just options one, two, three, and four in that order. So put those in, the hatch will open and you know, then you can get down in there. But it's a pretty easy puzzle to solve. So once you get into the basement, you come up to like a small vault area. You can either go left and go into the door, or you can explore the little foyer area that you're in, solve a small puzzle, get access to a vault, and then head down a secret entrance into the next room. But the door to your left will also just take you down into that room. It will just change your positioning a little. However, and it's not really super important. It pretty much plays out the same, even if you take the back route. You'll just get access to the vault faster. Because if you go to the room through the door, you can still find the entrance to the vault from the other side and not have to solve the puzzle. So, either or. Once you get down into the next room here, where you can find some geists. Now, you're seeing geists in my footage because I killed Raymond, as I mentioned, in Act 2. So, if you did not kill Raymond in Act 2 and he survived, you will find him in this basement and it will be a much tougher fight because he has the room rigged with explosives. If you killed him... He is not here, neither are his white magisters, and you just have to fight some geists. It is so much easier if you kill him in Act 2, but if you didn't, you're going to have to deal with that fight now. And the other part of this is that if Raimond is still alive and he triggers those explosives, it burns up some notes and you won't get as much information. So you can do that if you want, but like legit, you should totally kill Raimond in Act 2. It makes this so much easier. But I understand that not everybody will, so I felt the need to mention it. Once Ryman is either dead or the geists are dead, whatever you chose to do, you can find some notes around the room if they weren't burnt up in the explosives. And you can find out quite a bit of information that Vredeman, the guy who has been following, following Dallas around, is actually none other than Brockus Rex, who Tarquin, the necromancer we found aboard the Lady Vengeance, is in fact the guy who resurrected him because he was forced to by Dallas. Dallas found out he was a necromancer of some renown, you know, used force to forcibly make him resurrect Brockus Rex. A conversation we can have with uh, Tarquin, actually, if he's still alive and with us. He can explain kind of what happened. The other half of this is that we find out the White Magisters are in on the plan of Dallas's to get rid of Source. So as Dallas mentions in Act 3 when she attacks us, she thinks the world is better off without Divinity and she's trying to purge the rest of it. And this is where we find out that there is some pretty big distinctions between the White Magisters and the Magisters in the Red Suits. So the White Magisters are the leaders. They are in on the plan. They know what Dallas is actively trying to accomplish. The Red Magisters don't. And I think that this conversation in particular really adds some depth to the execution scene we saw upstairs. Because when you put it in that light, the paladin who was refusing to kill these Magisters was technically right. 
Like, there is no reason to be killing these Red Magisters. They honestly think they're just trying to protect the world. However, for the sake of roleplay, I have taken a very hard stance against Magisters because they imprisoned me at the start of the game, and I hate them. So, in addition to this, we lastly learn that Dallas is headed for the Tomb of Lucian. Because, again, she's trying to purge the source, and in theory... Loose in the Divine's body is still full of the stuff, so she's trying to get into Lucian's tomb to get access to his corpse, so we're told. Now this is where you will be interrupted by Lord Kim. Now that he's found, you know, once he hears all that commotion and they come and find you, uh, you can talk to Lord Kim. You can either tell him what you know, you can keep it to yourself, uh, you can kind of have some conversation there back and forth. Regardless, the next place we want to go, because we find out from a variety of sources in town, that the keeper of Lucian's tomb is none other than Arhu, who is a recurring character from all the way back in Divine Divinity. So we should absolutely know who Arhu is if you've played the prior games. Otherwise, he is a demigod who is half-cat, shall we say, to put it extremely lightly. There's way more to it than that, but basically he's half-cat. But he has a room, shall we say, at the cathedral at the very north end of town. And that's basically where we should go next to try to find out how we can get into Lucian's tomb. Now, before we go on, there is one more really important thing that can happen. Well, two, I guess, but one that we're going to focus on. Thing that can happen in the Magister's Barracks. If you go to the prison part of the Magister's Barracks, you can find none other than Wendigo imprisoned. So it was possible to encounter her on the Nameless Isle, which I didn't mention because she's not part of the main plot, but you can encounter her there. And I'm mentioning it now because it is part of the main plot. This can be like literally the fourth time you've ran into her and she's still alive as a skeleton in service to the God King, as we talked about last video. We can find Wendigo trapped and under interrogation by paladins, which is important because we can offer to take over those interrogations and talk to Wendigo. She begs to be freed. Now, this is a fun conversation because it is possible to convince her that you are trying to help her and that if you free her, she'll give you some information. You can do this in a way in which you'll free her and then she'll just give you the information totally without combat. It's also possible to free her and have her attack you immediately. And it is also possible to just walk away and not let her out. So whatever floats your boat. Plenty of options there. However, we're going to focus on the option where we successfully got her to give us information if we let her out. Because if you then let her out, she will then give you the information. Because at this point, because of her continued failed attempts to kill you, the God King has basically forsaken Wendigo, and she's real mad about it. So that kind of gives you some context. Now, if you free her, she will explain under this particular circumstance who the God King still has under his control in the city. Who has sworn a covenant to the God King? Spoiler alert, it's important. Now, if you haven't figured it out already, you would be among good company. I actually didn't see this coming until it got revealed and I was real mad about it. <laughs> Unfortunately, it seems that Lord Linder Kim, the commander of the Paladins, has in fact sworn a covenant to the God King. Linder Kim is in fact the God King's favored son, shall we say. Not like literally his son, but you know, as a turn of phrase. The other person in town who has sworn a covenant to the God King is none other than Isbeel, which is a dwarf serving in Queen Justinia's court, who is the Queen of the Dwarves. She is uh, kind of important. You can actually go all the way to Lucian just following the main plot without ever talking to Isbeel, but she is part of some side quest and beast's origin story. So just keep that in mind. We'll kind of swing back around to her in a little bit. But Wendigo will tell us early that these two are in fact sworn to the God King through a covenant. Wendigo from here will explain that she wants to break her own covenant with the God King. She is now going to go look for a sworn breaker, which as again, we mentioned in Act 3, is the second one in the game, the one in Arcs. And a sworn breaker is the only thing that can break a covenant with the God King and allow a soul to pass on. With that out of the way, we can go seek out Arhu. And again, he has a room in the cathedral towards the north of town. Now, once we go to Arhu, we'll find out that his room is locked. There's a couple ways to get in here. You can pick the lock, you can barge in. My personal favorite way is to sneak in. If you go to the right, you can find a balcony, which you can use skills then to get to the other part of Arhu's balcony and then go in through his window through lock picking. I personally find that to be the most fun, but there are multiple options to get into Lucian's room, or uh, Arhu's room. Now, unfortunately, Arhu isn't here, and we don't have long to look around before Lord Linder Kim 
comes barging through the room. Now, at this point, we may or may not know that he's aligned with the God King. We don't have to point it out. And even if you do point it out, he's like, nah, man, not at all. And just kind of brushes it under the rug. So wouldn't really bother with it at this point in time. But Arhu's missing. And if you are quick enough in your search or whether or not you found out by other means, because you can, you can find out that Arhu had a meeting at Linder Kim's mansion. And that's the last time he was seen. So regardless of whether or not you know about his God King affiliation, the next place we're going to is Linder Kim's mansion to investigate. Now once we get to Kim's mansion, we basically want to look around. We can talk to people who can talk about seeing a white cat around, that kind of thing, but there's also a side quest with a woman named Cat the Appraiser who implies that Lord Kim has a secret vault. Now I mentioned this side quest because this is probably the easiest way to find the vault, but you can also just stumble upon it. You can also learn about it from other sources. There's a couple other places you can learn about the vault, such as the kids in the sewer, because there is a small group of vagrant children living in the sewer that you can run into. And in fact, you will have needed to run into them. So before we go any further, I want to mention that in the sewers, again, you can find a small little thieves guild of kids. Now, if you go in there, you talk to them without triggering a fight. So if you trigger a fight, you gotta fight a bunch of trolls because the children have troll guards, which is awesome. You either have to kill them and then you know, kind of just look around the room or talk to the children if you've successfully persuaded your way in the door. You can notice that there is a big painting in the like little kids thieve guild trove area and it is a very impressive painting. Now, if you haven't been to Kim's vault yet, you can be like, hey, where'd you get this? And the kids, if again, if you pass some persuasion, be like, oh yeah, we robbed Kim's vault and stole some stuff. So that's another way you can learn about the vault. This is important later because, uh, spoiler alert, you just need that painting. And I recommend you get it before you do this next part with Kim's vault because it'll make this one trip instead of two. You need that painting in order to access the inner part of Kim's vault. Circling back around, in Kim's mansion, if you go to the gardens, and the kids will have told you this as well, by the way, they'll mention how to get into the vault. But again, you can also find it on your own. There is actually a lever in Kim's gardens on the backside of his mansion that you can find. And what it does is lowers the water level in his little pond, which gives access to a secret hatch, which actually leads down into the vault. You can either pick lock your way into the hatch or you can actually find a key to it in Kim's mansion as well. And this will drop you down into the first part of Kim's mansion. Now, you're immediately gonna notice some giant Lucian statues stomping around, <laughs> so, these guys are annoying. Even if you put them down, they will come back to life in three turns. However, if you use source vampirism on them while they're deactivated, it will permanently destroy them. But getting them deactivated is the problem. These guys are pretty tough. Try to single them out if you want to fight them. However, you can also just sneak by them and ignore them entirely, which I recommend doing because they're not you know, really necessary at this point. On the back side of Kim's mansion, whether we fought or snuck our way back there, we will find a painting that is missing the middle painting. As you've probably put together by now, we need the painting from the kids in the sewer to put in the middle to unlock it, which will then unlock a secret door to a small inner sanctum of the vault. Once we snap into this inner vault, we can find a bunch of bookshelves. One will have a mysterious book, and if we pull that book, it unlocks yet another secret door into a deeper part of the vault. If we step in here, we will come to this really crazy looking room with an altar to the God King. If we have not found out that Lord Linder Kim is aligned with the God King already, this is where we're gonna find out about it if we just missed that fact or we didn't talk to Wendigo. Now, if we freed Wendigo, she is in this room because she uh, basically is um, on her last legs as far as health goes and she can't quite get to the Sworn Breaker, which is in the next room. Now, once we get close to the God King statue, the God King will interrupt and have a conversation with us and be like, hey man, turn back before you die. So obviously we're going to ignore his very stern warnings and we're going to walk up to his altar. Now, what we need to do here is read the plaque on the altar, which will say something about the weight of responsibility. And what you may or may not have noticed in the prior room to this, the first inner like vault area, there's a big painting on the wall. If you go back to that painting, its name is literally responsibility. So obviously pick that up, go back down to the vault, put the painting on the altar, and the weight of that will activate the altar, which will slide out of the way, revealing another hatch to the final room of Kim's vault, where Arhu is being tormented by spirits. In addition to this, there is a sworn breaker in the hands of the statue just beyond Arhu. So that's where the sworn breaker is, by the way. Arhu is being 
kept in place, shall we say, by like some pain ghosts. So ghosts are like tormenting him that you need spirit vision to see and you need to source vampirism them away to free Arhu, which blacks Arhu out so he's not a ton of help. He kind of passes out from the pain of this endeavor. And when that happens, and once Arhu is free, you will be attacked by some Black Ring members. And then on the second turn, Lord Linderkim will enter the room. Now, if Wendigo got to the vault because you freed her, he will have Wendigo as a hostage in front of him because if you remember, she was in the previous room. Now, unfortunately, this is the part where that storyline loses a little bit of luster because if you got this far, you can't give her the Sworn Breaker anymore because uh, Linderkim is about to execute her in front of you. So you can't do anything even if you got this far to get that Sworn Breaker to give to her. The only way you can free Wendigo from her covenant at this point is if you actually didn't free her and thus didn't have the information about Lord Linder Kim up to this point. So just kind of an interesting little play on things. Now, obviously, this is where we're going to have to fight Lord Linder Kim. This is the single most annoying fight in the game to me. I don't like the Kraken fight. I hate this fight, which is why I cheese it every single time, even on higher difficulties. Gotta hate this fight so much. So Lord Linderkim is immune to Death Fog because he's sworn to the God King, which means he's technically undead, which means Death Fog won't affect him. However, his four adds in the room who are amazingly strategically in place are not. So if you've managed to steal some Death Fog, there's actually a ton of it in the sewers of arcs. So if you go down there, get some of those barrels of Death Fog, and then go do this fight. You can actually place the Barrels of Death Fog where the spawns spawn in at, and then, you know, break them so the Death Fog spreads. And then the four adds, as soon as they step into battle, will actually die immediately from the Death Fog. And then you'll just have to fight Lord Linder Kim, which is leaps and bounds easier than dealing with his annoying people. Because again, this fight is really annoying and Linder Kim is probably the strongest melee character in the game. Like even some of the uh, in-game fight bosses do not hit as hard as this dude does in melee. It's ridiculous. Now, once that fight is out of the way, we can talk to either Arhu himself or his spirit if he died in the fight. It is super easy for Arhu to die in this fight. It is annoying. In fact, most guides tell you to straight up personally teleport Arhu out of the way so he doesn't get hit by a bunch of the AoEs that are going to be flying around and is thus less likely to die. But Arhu is incredibly likely to die in this fight, especially on higher diff- Now we either want to talk to you again, either Arhu himself or his spirit, and he will explain that everyone keeps trying to get into Lucian's tomb and that Arhu was told by Lucian to seal his body away, that none may see it in repose, basically. He doesn't know why one doesn't question a divine, as he puts it. So Arhu had this elaborate path to Lucian's tomb constructed, which I've been a little vague about up to this point. I'm aware some of you might have been asking, hey, why don't you just go straight for Lucian's tomb? Why do we have to do all this talking to Arhu nonsense? Well, this is why. So in order to get to Lucian's tomb, the first thing you have to just do is uh, traverse what's called the Path of Blood. Now, the Path of Blood is a pilgrimage, technically, of sorts, where basically you walk into the entrance to Lucian's tomb. A statue there will ask you some questions about whether you've lied, murdered, stolen, that kind of thing. And if you lie to this statue about literally any of it, it kills you outright. In fact, when you walk up to it for the first time, you'll see somebody run in there and get murdered by the statue. Now, Arhu will explain that, obviously, everyone... You know, especially if you've made it this far in the game, you've killed a lot of people. So you're never going to pass that test. Arhu will explain that there is a failsafe because he knows the person who worked on it and made this uh, path of blood, which is the toy maker in town. The toy maker has an amulet that can help you bypass the main protections of the path of blood. Now that we're talking about it, though, there is a second way past the path of blood. So if you go to Sergeant Zrilla on the Lady Vengeance, who is the person who hires mercenaries for you if you either lost or got rid of an origin character off of your team and want to replace them with, you know, someone, you can go to Sergeant Zrilla who will give you a generic mercenary that you can then customize into whoever you want. If you go to Sergeant Zrilla in Act you know, four here in Arcs before, you know, once you've gotten into town, you can ha uh, you can hire a mercenary from her and then immediately 
take that mercenary to the path of blood, and then that person can honestly answer the questions that they haven't lied, murdered, stolen, or anything, because technically, under your control, they haven't, which will successfully pass the path of blood the old-fashioned way, shall we say. So that is technically a workaround if you're absolutely having an impossible time with the rest of this, which is possible. There's a huge difficulty spike in arcs, especially on Tactician and R mode. One more thing, R who also explains that there is a room on the way to Lucian's tomb known as the Death Room. And basically what you need to do is there will be a bunch of levers everywhere and you need to pull the levers which are named to where the first letter of each named lever spells out power. He also tells you this, you can learn this other places. This is not the only way to get this information, but you know, we're saving him and he gives us the, this information at the same time as telling us how to get past the path of blood. So I think it's pretty useful. Now from here, we want to go talk to the toy maker who's just off the town square. From talking to the toy maker, he explains that, you know, he made the path of blood and in order to get by it, you need a necklace that is brimming with source and a scroll with a magic spell on it, basically. So there's a switch near the statue that questions you. You can put the amulet that is filled with source in a switch nearby and then read the scroll and a hatch will open up without you having to pass the Path of Blood's trial. It's also interesting to note that the toy maker didn't get sent to Fort Joy despite being a sorcerer, be like specifically because Arhu protected him and basically told the Magisters no. So that tells you right there that Arhu has a ton of authority even when they're rounding up sorcerers. Once we get the amulet filled up with source, which is the first thing the toy maker gives us, so basically you just have to put the amulet on and then source vampire a bunch of stuff, uh, consume some source orbs, basically just give the amulet five charges of source points, which you do by doing anything that'll gain you source while wearing the amulet, and then take it back to the toy maker when he'll be like, oh great, now you have the amulet all charged up. If you go upstairs, here's a password to a chest where you can get the magic spell that you need. Now when you head upstairs, to get that magic spell, you'll be attacked by the toy maker's toy puppets that he has everywhere because they will be possessed by the god king and used to attack you. These guys aren't super hard, they don't have a lot of health, but what they do have is a ton of very high-powered magics. So they will use a ton of high, uh, high-powered source abilities against you, which is annoying. So they do a ton of damage, but the puppets themselves don't have a ton of health, which is helpful. And once we kill all these puppets, we can go to the toy, ma to the toy maker's special chest, uh, write down the password that he gave us on a piece of parchment, which unlocks it and then gives us the spell we need to finally get past the Path of Blood. Now that we have all this, we're going to go to the Path of Blood. It's just in the cathedral. It's very easy to enter. You just literally enter a door. There's literally a Path of Blood leading to it. It's pretty easy to find. You'll enter the door where the Path of Blood takes place. And, you know, again, instead of engaging with the statue in the middle of the room, you'll find a switch to the side. You'll put the charred amulet in that switch. Then you'll read the spell. Then this hatch opens and you can go down further into Lucian's tomb. Once you hop down there, you can find that obviously people have beaten you here. You can find skeletons and things like that uh, around. So people have gotten this far before. But there's also a big tomb, like, uh, like a big sarcophagus in the middle of the room. And if you click on that, there's nothing actually in there, just as a quick aside. This is the part where I want to mention Karen. So Karen, K-A-R-O-N, not the other kind of Karen. Karen is the first god woken that was found after Lucian died, supposedly. Karen can actually be found in the Magister Barracks sewers. If you go deep down past the prison area in the Magister's Barracks, you can find Karen locked up in a cage as a child. So he's putting on a, an illusion to appear as a child. He's trapped in a cage by spirits down in the sewers down there. And the spirits will explain to you that Karen, despite using the illusion to look like a child and pull at your heartstrings, was the first god woken the Seekers ever found and tried to get to ascend to divinity in Lucian's place after he died. If we talk to Karen, we can find out that basically he was driven insane because after all this training and stuff that he received from the Seekers, he did grow very powerful, but he started to then receive visions of Lucian that explained that he just needed to kill all these people. So he basically turned into a murderous psychopath and started killing Seekers and then the Seekers locked him up. Now Karen is more aptly referred to as The Mistake. Like that's his big name. 
Karen did not exist in the original version of the game. Karen was added with the revamp to arcs that I mentioned earlier. And it was just, again, to kind of add some meat to the bones of this next part. Karen explains that he needs to get down to Lucian's body so he can serve Lucian some more. And, you know, he's going to try to kill you. You need to dispose of him. Now, even if you found Karen and then left him in his cage, he will still attack you right here. If you didn't find him at all, he'll still attack you right here. He's just going to attack you right here. But that said, it is possible to kill him in the sewers before you get here as well. So keep in mind, that is an option. Now, from here, we have a very annoying puzzle. So if we go to the north part of this room here, we're going to find a puzzle. Now, it, if this is your first time running into this, it's going to take some figuring out. Below you are two blessed substances and big bowls, a grid of sorts with a bunch of pipe-looking things leading through, like, blocks that you can then turn. There are three empty bowls on the far end of the puzzle. And the middle bowl nearest you is also empty. Now, what you need to do is take the blessed substances from your side of the puzzle and get them to reach their appropriate bowl on the far end, which you can tell which one goes where because on the far end of the puzzle, in addition to the empty bowls, just behind those empty bowls are another set of empty bowls full of blessed substances that you can actually tell what they are. Now, first thing you need to do here is there is an empty bowl on your side that um, obviously you need to fill with something, otherwise you can't travel it to the third bowl on the other side. What you need to do here is there is a grate near you. You need to somehow make blood go into that grate, be it either hitting one of your companions or using the skill Blood Rain, for instance. Something like that. Blood needs to find its way onto this grate. Because if you put blood into this grate, it will then fill up the empty bowl nearest you. Now from there, you need to cast Bless on the blood that goes into the grate, but not just yet. We'll get to that. Because if we cast it right now, by the time we get the blood into the bowl at the end of the puzzle, the bless effect will have worn off and it will just be back to regular blood. So we need to solve the puzzle and then lastly bless the bowl so the bless substance on the end matches the rhythm, shall we say, towards the end. Now I know that sounds confusing and I probably didn't explain it super well, so as you will have noticed there is a big picture of how this puzzle is supposed to look when you are done. All the paths you're supposed to take, how you're supposed to arrange the bowls, this is how it's done. I figure it's easier than wasting everybody's time with how to like actually do it. Now, once we get done with this puzzle, we come to a big causeway where we have to pass a bridge into a door. The door will be like, uh, you sure you want to do this? This is uh, only death after this. So this is our marker into the death room that I mentioned earlier. Once we step into this room, puppets that we saw earlier start going off like crazy. And they'll run around and they will pull all sorts of levers throughout this room. These levers will do all sorts of crazy stuff. Teleport people, activate traps, deactivate traps, cause fireballs to rain from the sky. All sorts of crazy stuff. What you need to do is, like I mentioned earlier, you need to find the levers, you can see this by mousing over them, and spell out the word power with the first letter of the names of the levers. They're kind of all over the room, just mouse over them, you can see their names, you can do this literally without moving a single character, just mouse over the levers, make sure you got the right one, P-O-W-E-R. It's like empathy, righteousness uh, for E and R. Wisdom, I think, is the W. So stuff like that. You just spell out power with the levers, and then that'll deactivate the force field and the puppets and the traps and everything. And then that'll open the final door. From here, we can head down the stairs past the port, like the door that we just opened, the source barrier that we just took down. Probably a better way to put it. We can then go down the stairs on the far end of this, and this is where the final part of the game commences. So we're going to take a quick interjection to wrap up the origin character's stories before we get to the final fight. We're gonna skip Sabeel because Sabeel's story ended on the Nameless Isle in the act just prior to this. But everyone else's pretty well ends in Act 4. So let's start with the Red Prince. The Red Prince in Act 3 learned that Sadia was supposed to be an Ark somewhere, which is the Red Princess who he maybe did or didn't mate with at Act 2. We need to go to Arcs to find Sadia. Now we can find either from dialogue or actually just going there that Sadia was last seen at the Lizard Consulate. The Lizard Consulate is just north of Lord Linderkim's mansion. 
Now when you get there, it's destroyed and you need to find your way to the garden. Now once you get to the garden area, if you use your spirit vision skill, if you don't have it active, you will find out that there is a large portal over the water area here in the lizard consulate and that you need to go through it because you're very certain that Sadia is hiding in it. So once we go through this portal, we're deposited into an arena of sorts. And as soon as you move, you'll be attacked by a dream version of Malady, Alexander, and Windigo. Now, you don't have to engage with this fight at all if you know what you're doing. You're in this little coliseum-like area, and there are black mirrors everywhere. What you need to do is kill the black mirrors, which will then, once they're all destroyed, open up a door to the north that you can then go through. If you do not destroy the Black Mirrors before you engage Alexander, Malady, and Windigo, if they die, they will just pop right back up through one of the mirrors. So it's very annoying. Even if you want to kill all of them instead of just dipping out through the door early, you still need to kill all the mirrors before you try to fight them. Now once that's done, we can go through that door. We can find Brahmos on the other side of it, the lizard dreamer from Act 2. And Brahmos will be like, oh, thank God you're here. Sadia is waiting just past this door. But he'll only tell the Red Prince this, obviously. And he'll give the Red Prince a key to this door, which will then lead us to Sadia. So we go through it. We're in a little desert area. And we can go talk to Sadia, who is right down here. Now from here, the Red Prince can make a few different decisions. If the Red Prince and Sadia mated up to this point, Sadia will have an egg with her and she'll explain that it will hatch into a dragon per the prophecy. I've already expressed my distaste about this prophecy. I won't go into it again here. She'll explain that, again, the egg will hatch into a red dragon per this prophecy if the red prince uses his flame breath on it, which will then hatch the egg. You can technically hatch the egg with any other lizard's fire breath, but Sadia will attack you if you do this. You need to do it with the red prince if you want to go that route. Now the catch is, is as I mentioned in Act 2, Sadia is actually sworn to the God King as well. So if you want to break that, you need the Sworn Breaker. She is honestly the person I recommend giving it to outside of Almira, because Wendigo I don't think really deserves it, as she has tried to kill you multiple times. So honestly, even if you do save Wendigo, I don't recommend giving it to her anyway, personally. But that said, Sadia also needs one. Now this is where we start running into a problem because we have three people who could use a Sworn Breaker and there's only two in the game. So you need to make a decision somewhere. There's potentially four in the game, but we'll get into that in a minute. You can either save Sadia with the Sworn Breaker and hatch the Red Prince's uh, dragon babies and which is the best ending for the red prince technically that's the good ending if you will you can hatch the eggs and then not manage to free sadia which will obviously not be the greatest ending but it's better than nothing the red prince can refuse to mate with her all around and never have gotten the egg to begin with and then you can choose to help her kill sadia you can also kill sadia outright never mate with her which is considered probably like a not great ending but like also not a terrible ending either because she did swear herself to the God King. Make your decision, and that is pretty much the Red Prince's outcome. So kind of just whatever you want to do there. Now moving on from there, we are going to talk about Losa. So Losa has probably the coolest origin story ending, and I have to talk about it in some terms because her origin story wraps up with the last boss. So does Ifans and Fanes. But Losa's up to this point, we found out that she was being, of course, possessed by the demon Andromalik, who is actually Dr. Deva, who resides in the city of Arks, which is where we are. Now, after a few key events in Arks, we can get an invitation from Dr. Deva to come see him. Malady will actually pop up right outside the doctor's mansion or Andromalik's mansion, and she'll explain that she found a way to weaken him, provided you've done Losa's story up to this point anyway. Now, if you go with Malady, you'll find these candles in a little pocket realm that Andromalik has made for himself. And these candles represent souls. And as you snuff them out, it kills the person in the real world, but it also decreases Andromalik's power. And the big reveal is that there are thousands of them. There are tons of these candles. Andromalik has been doing this a very long time. But you can choose to snuff out all the candles, weakening Andromalik which will save you a ton of hassle in the fight with him if you choose to fight him. That said, you can also choose not to, and you can still kill Andromalik, but the fight is much harder, so make your decision. Now, once you're done with this, either way, you'll leave the 
area with Malady. Now the really cool part here, this has real implications for the broader city of Arcs because if you do this and you snuff out all the candles, you can straight up find corpses just in the street now because these people had made deals with Andromalik. And because you wiped out his candles, which was that person's soul, you killed them and you can just find their bodies throughout Arcs. It's awesome. Now that said, from here, uh, you go to the door to Dr. Davis place. Um, you can go in that way. If you're Losa, it'll just open right up for you. There's a bunch of nurses here, which are actually corrupted, possessed elves that will help the doctor. So I recommend you kill them. And then you can go talk to Andromalik yourself. Now, if Jehan is still with you, if you chose to take him on to the Lady Vengeance after his part in Act 2, which is an option, Jehan will have already tried to attack uh, Andromalik, and he is trapped in the basement. Now, there is a side quest in Act 2, which has a bunch of uh, implications about how Dr. Deva is getting, like, Voidwoken fish or something delivered to him in Arcs. And there is a very convoluted method to, like, get teleported into the Doctor's basement rather than going to fight him directly through his front door, which is convoluted. I've never personally got that to work right, to be honest with you. So it's usually easier to just go through the front door. But once you get to Dr. Deva slash Andromalik, you can have a conversation with him where it turns out that Andromalik doesn't want to kill Losa, which is why he hasn't just fully taken her over at this point. What Andromalik would like to do is share divinity with her. He possessed her as a godwoken because he wants her to claim divinity, thus making himself a sort of demon divine, shall we say. And you can agree to this. You can absolutely be like, yeah, man, all right, totally, let's do it. That is an option. You can do that. Now, alternatively, what most people are going to do and what, you know, any good person would do is you'll kill Andromalik, which again is much easier if you did the part with Malady where you weakened him. In fact, you can kill him in one turn. Now, once you defeat Andromalik, if you choose to actually fight him, it will free Losa from his control. It does seem there's like a sliver of him left in her, as you can talk about through dialogue options, but... Losa will sing you a song and will like literally sing you a song that the game will play audio for, which is really cool. And there you go. You freed Losa of her demon. Unless you chose to... Unless, of course, you chose to side with Andromalik and help him claim divinity through you. Which, again, you can do, but we'll get into that in a bit. That brings us to Beast. Beast, as we know, was looking for Queen Justinia in Arcs after he found out about her plot to bring a bunch of death fog into the city of Arcs through the events of Acts 2 and 3. Lohar, at the end of Act 2, will have given Beast an invitation to a wedding for a prominent dwarf in Arcs. We can go to that wedding, find out that it was actually attacked by Voidwoken during the ceremony, and through some investigation, we can find our way into the sewers beneath town, just underneath the dwarven wedding area, and we can find our way to Queen Justinia and Isbeel, who is holed up in the sewers under arcs. And from this conversation, we learn that Isbeel has been basically kind of manipulating Queen Justinia into constantly fighting these rebels. Queen Justinia and Isbeel have come up with a plan to death fog the entire city of arcs. So here's the thing. You can do this if you want to. There's a fight with uh, Queen Justinia and Isbeel, of course, but you only fight Isbeel. Queen Justinia comes in after it, which I'll get to in a second. But when you first find them, you'll have a conversation with them. If you choose to go along with it, they'll actually uh, paralyze you and knock you out and everything. And then you'll come to in this pit where a fight will ensue. And you'll have to fight uh, Isbeel and her minions, which are all around. Again, they're immune to death fog, so you can't actually break the death fog barrels that are laying around everywhere to help kill them because they're all undead and it's not going to affect Isbeel at least. So that's a tough fight, especially on harder difficulties. But should you win... You can then go up to the big death fog machine that they planned on using to deliver the death fog to the city of Arcs, and you can choose to uh, either unleash it on Arcs or pump it out to the sea where it can't hurt anyone. You can actually do this. You can pump death fog up to the city of Arcs, which will kill almost everyone in the city. Obviously, there's a few exceptions as some people are undead, but you, you can do it if you want. You can kill almost everyone in Arcs, which is hilarious that it's an option, but it's also not very useful. The smart thing to do, obviously, would be to pump it out to sea. Now, once that's done, you can make your way to a side door where you'll encounter Justinia because she was knocked out too or something, and she'll 
come barreling through the door. And if you have Beast with you, you can choose to save or spare her, and Beast will have some extra dialogue options along with that as far as forgiving her because she was clearly being manipulated by Isbeel. And then she can reconcile with Beast, or you can choose to kill Queen Justinia for her, you know, trying to death fog the entire city of Arks. You can see it both ways on that one. And that is it for Beast. Now that brings us to Fane and Ifan. So both of their origin stories actually kind of wrap up in the end fight. But just to recap them real quick before we go into the end fight, Fane has found out up to this point as he's recovered his memories and stuff that it was none other than him that discovered the Veil of Source that allowed the gods to... uh, usurp power from the god king and turn themselves into gods. Fane was discovered the veil of source that enabled that. We also find out that the Voidwoken are actually Eternals that have sided with the Void in an effort to try to get back into Rivalon and reclaim the source that pushed them out because every source uh, user that dies helps them get back into the world, which is why they show up wherever source is used. And that Fane, if you chose to in Act 3, could actually swear a covenant to the god king becoming the potential fourth person to need a sworn breaker, which again, you can find one in Arcs. The rest of his story wraps up in the end fight, so I'll cover it when we get there in just a minute. Uh, same thing with Ifan. He learns that, you know, he was a lone wolf. Uh, the lone wolves as an organization were used to hunt down Godwoken, which it finds out that, you know, the Black Ring and stuff were the ones paying them to do that. He finds out that Lucian was killing Godwoken in the Academy, which shakes him up real bad because Ifan used to be a member of the Divine Order, which were the Paladins and everything. Ifan personally delivered the Death Fog to all the Elves uh, about nine years prior to this, and he's been real shaken up about it since then. And we'll get into how his story wraps up in the end fight as well. Now that brings us back to the final fight of the game. So as we step into the final chamber, we'll be greeted by all the characters on the Lady Vengeance who have made it here alive. So if Gareth has died, if Almira didn't make it or you never talked to her, if you killed Tarquin, if Malady died, then they won't be here. But if they made it, they will come into this room and they will begin a prayer for you, which is important because for every one of them that made it up to three, their prayers for you in this moment trying to claim divinity will actually reduce the source cost of source abilities by one point. And because they are only at a maximum three points cost, you only need three of them to make it here to reduce that cost to zero, which will let you use your source abilities for just action points which will really help out in this fight, especially if you make it the hard way. So, this is a pretty small room. As we come around down the stairs, we run into none other than Lucian the Divine. He is not dead. He has not been dead. He faked his death. We come into this conversation like, holy shit, you're Lucian the Divine. What is going on here? Dallas is also here. Vredeman, who is actually Brockus Rex, is here, which we could have found out, as well as some white magisters hanging around. This is an incredible conversation with Lucian where we get all the big plot reveals. To cover the origin characters real quick, it turns out that Dallas is not Dallas. She is Fane's daughter. So she's actually an eternal. The person who discovered where Fane and his family were imprisoned for what they did, which was, you know, well, what Fane did, which was discovering the source and everything. When Fane was punished for that, they were basically imprisoned in a tomb. The person who opened that tomb was the actual Dallas, the actual Magister Dallas. The daughter of Fane wound up killing this woman and taking her place through Fane's face ripper mask that lets them, you know, transform into human beings that we would have found out about throughout the game. Fane has this big uh, coming to Jesus moment, so to speak, with the divine Lucian and his daughter, and he needs to basically accept that for what it is. And then he gets an extra ending option that is just for Fane that we'll talk about when I get to the ending sections here in just a minute. But that's kind of the bulk of his origin story right there. And basically he's conflicted because, you know, he's a member of the Eternals, who are the people sentenced to the Voidwoken, so does he help them come back and take their rightful place in the world? Does he feel bad for causing his daughter so much pain? His wife apparently died in this somewhere or another. And basically he has to come to grips with, you know, does he leave that behind them or does he help the Eternals re-enter the world? That's one of the special endings for him that we'll get to here in a minute. Because up to this point, he might actually still be sworn to the God King if you didn't use a sworn breaker, 
which makes that ending the default. And then Ifan, confronted with the fact that Lucian is still alive and didn't even die, which he faked his death, Ifan basically has to make the decision of, can he forgive Lucian for the things Lucian has done? Because Lucian has caused the deaths of so many people. Can Ifan let that go or not? That's probably the crux of Ifan's personal story, in my opinion. Can he forgive Lucian for what Lucian was trying to do? And the th horrible things that Lucian did in pursuit of that. And if you're playing Ifan, you get to make that decision. Now, that's how those wrap up. Uh, that's it for Ifan. He doesn't get any special endings. Um, we will cover Fane's special ending here in just a minute. So, as I just mentioned, you can talk to Lucian. He's like, uh, yeah, I'm still alive, as it turns out. Through this conversation, we learn a lot of stuff. But basically, Lucian used the events in 1233 when he was fighting Damien and attempting to banish him to Nemesis. He had to death fog all these elves. In doing so, Lucian used that to uh, fake his own death, where he decided to go into a Tenebrium lace tomb that he had already had built by Arhu and the Toymaker. Tenebrium blocks source. Like, it's, it's, Tenebrium is like what lead is to radioactivity. It just blocks it from moving. So no one can detect source uh, on the other side of a Tenebrium barrier. Tenebrium is like a special type of metal. Lucian had this entire tomb set up laced with Tenebrium, so despite being alive, even the gods would think he was dead because even they can't see past Tenebrium and this tomb was lined with it. Now, from here, Lucian decided to start siphoning source from the gods, which weakened them, which allowed the void to come in. However, that's not the beginning of it. Lucian made a mistake when he ordered the uh, elves death fogged. You see, as I mentioned earlier, and as you will have found out throughout the game, the gods feed on people's source. People are born, they gather source throughout their life, they die, the gods feed on that source. It's a ever-turning system. In death fogging all of those elves, that was the first crack because it weakened Tyr Sindilius to the point that the Void was able to get a foothold because of it. And then they started pouring through to attack Source users, and that's when people using Source started attracting the Void. Lucian made this even worse when he shirked his duties and started siphoning Source off. So, why is he doing this, and why is Dallas helping him? Well, Dallas is helping him because she truly believes that it's what's for the best. Uh, Dallas, being Fane's daughter, got a first front row seat to what Source does for these gods. So she believes in Lucian's mission, which is to purge Source from the world entirely. Lucian is siphoning all this Source, gathering it all together, because he wants to purge it from the world, which will put a permanent end to the Void Woken by sealing the Veil of Source that Fane discovered, which will then, of course, permanently lock the Void Woken out because they will no longer have a way in. And basically, Lucian plans on, after this happening, of basically staying in power as a false divine. He'll have no real power, but people won't know that. And he'll be able to use his position to basically bring the world to heal through peace, finally. Thing is, the last bit of source they need is from none other than you. So they ask you whether or not you want to surrender your source peacefully, or do you want to fight for it? Because if you say no, they're going to fight you. You can choose to fight Lucian over this right here, right now. You can be like, no, man, I'm not giving up my source. I came here to become divine. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to take that. Screw the greater good of the world. Let's fight over this. You can do that, but I don't recommend it. Because if you do that, you are actually going to have to fight everybody in the room and then it turns out that Vredemann goes full Brockus Rex on everybody and enters a phase two of the fight where then you'll have to fight everyone. Lucian, Dallas, Brockus and his minions. It's a nightmare. Now luckily, you only really need to focus on Brockus to end that fight. So if you go that route, that's my recommendation to you. Focus on Brockus. You cannot hope to kill all of these people. It's a pain. Just focus on Brockus. If you do that, it'll make your life so much easier. That said, the easier thing to do is agree to give up your source. Now you might be thinking, why would you do that? Well, besides the inherent good that would actually do the world, there's also a more tactical reason behind it. Regardless of whether or not you choose to give up your source, Brockus then goes full crazy and attacks anyway, entering phase two by completely skipping phase one. In addition to skipping phase one, Lucian, Dallas, and the white magisters that are there will be on your side fighting Brockus Rex, which makes him super easy to kill, 
even on higher difficulties. But you might be thinking, well, I still don't want to give up my source. Why would I choose that option? Well, fun fact, this dialogue with Lucian is not choosing any of the endings. It's literally just choosing the conditions of the ending fight. After you kill Brockus, even if you skip to phase two by saying you'll surrender your source and then fighting Brockus Rex because, you know, he jumps out and is like, ah, we're going to fight anyway because I'm going to become divine. Now, once that happens and you defeat Brockus Rex, then conversations will happen where you will then actually pick the ending, which is what we're about to get into. So regardless of your dialogue options with Lucian just now, that does not pick the ending. The conversation after the fight picks the ending. Now, there are actually a ton of endings. We are going to cover the main endings, and there are also all sorts of little slides that talk about areas of the game you were in. Did you kill Gratiana on Act 1 by destroying her soul jar? Did you save Tarquin or kill him? Is uh, Gareth still alive? What is he doing? All sorts of stuff like that. That really depends on whether or not people came with you or you made it, but it'll kind of discuss how things played out for those people. I'm not really gonna cover any of those. We're just sticking with like the main plot ending parts. Now, first and foremost, and probably the most straightforward, you can choose to become divine. So once this fight wraps up, it is implied that Lucian is out of commission somehow or another and you can choose what to do yourself. So you can choose to take the Atiran that had gathered all that source on the Nameless Isle and from all these other people, and you can use that to become the Divine. You can do that. You can also pass on Divinity, in which case your companions will usually pass on Divinity as well. If you choose to do that, if none of your player characters choose to take up the mantle of Divinity or do anything with it, the God King will actually swoop in and claim it for himself, which is obviously a pretty bad ending and involves uh, all mortal races basically being wiped out and the world replaced with Eternals. So that's an option. Um, there are the two non-becoming the divine options, which are, of course, sharing source with the entire world, with the idea being that if you give that much source to everyone throughout the world, then, you know, if everyone's divine, no one's divine kind of thing. And then the other option is to follow through with Lucian's plan to purge Source from the world and seal the veil of Source that caused all these problems in the first place, thus locking the Eternals out basically forever. There is also the deal you could have made with Andromalik. You don't need to be Losa to do this, by the way. Losa has her origin character kind of rooted in it, but if you any of your characters went and made a deal with Andromalik, he will come help you in the final battle and he'll kill Lucian outright, and then you'll share divinity with him. I don't recommend doing this because that ending sees the entire world enslaved to demons because the demon divine slowly takes over the actual divine, which is you, and you fail. So keep in mind, you can side with Andromalik, but I would not recommend it. Thane gets a special ending where he willingly sides with the Eternals and allows them to come back into the world like they wanted throughout the entire game because in a lot of ways, Rivalon belonged to the Eternals first. So if you have him with you, you can actually choose to do that and let the Eternals in. And that is the bulk endings of the game. So here's the thing. Despite all of those being an option, it is unlikely any of them besides Source being purged are actually canon. We know this because Divinity 2 exists and a lot of the lore from Divinity Fallen Heroes marketing was released before that project got halted. So because of this, we know that more than likely what happened is that Lucian got away with. Canonically, this is the most likely. I can't say for sure, but what most likely happened is Lucian got his way. That he managed to purge Source and restore the Veil, which purged Source from the world. And then from there, went on to become the False Divine, which explains why he was so easily overtaken when Damien came back from Nemesis and his fake assassination by Dragon Knights took place in the Dragon Knight saga. So, that is the story of Divinity 2, which I also have a video series on. You can check out if you're curious about what I mean. That is the most likely canonical ending because some of the marketing for Divinity Fallen Heroes actually specifically mentions it taking place in a world purged of source. So there you go. That's the most likely. I can't verify it, but more than likely that's the ending. To wrap it up, Lucian was actually alive the entire time. He was the one sapping the gods of their strength, which was allowing the Void Woken in after he messed up 
and death fogged all these elves, which caused the initial crack, oh, which gave the Void Woken a foothold, and it kind of snowballed out of control from there, with Lucian constantly imposing his sacrifices must be made mantra on the rest of the world. So, tell me what you guys think of the story. I want to hear all about it. Personally, I think uh, this Divinity Original Sin 2 made Lucian out to be a bit of a nut job who tried to be very utilitarian by saying that he knows what's best for everyone and doing god-awful things to achieve that. Let me know what you guys think down below. I'm very curious to hear from you. This is a very long video. So, with that out of the way, I hope you guys enjoyed it. As Jehan would say, may you wander in wisdom. Have an amazing day. So it ended, a tale that began with my own ill-fated attempt to rid the world of the god -woken. A new divine rose, a true heir to the Seven, more powerful than ever, and united Rivalon in its battle against the Void. All across the realm, he was loved, worshipped, and adored. Humans, lizards, elves, and dwarves all rallied to his banner. The Great Allegiance stood once more, but the war continued. From the depths of the Void, the God King still sought to return. As for me, my last hope of ever being freed of the God King's terrible tyranny faded when the God woke and claimed divinity. An eternity of pain and suffering is mine. I cling now to the dream that one day the veil will be sealed. That one day I can be freed. That one day a new God Woken will rise. Better than you. You look out to the endless beyond. The sun's light plays upon the waves, just as it always did. The sails flutter in the wind, just as they all... And with a start, you realize where you must go next. against the void woken blight. The black pits took fire. The oil there burns still. Driftwood teetered on the edge of starvation until the night the void woken came from the sea. All were killed, 
This did, however, put an end to the famine. The Nameless Isle had vanished. Although only open water remained, by instinct ships would steer clear. None of the captains could articulate why. Sir Gareth thanked the surviving seekers for their service and gave them their freedom. Disillusioned with ongoing war, he set out alone to find a new purpose. He would never stop seeking. Young Han grew up a warrior and became one of the Alliance's greatest generals. But even he could not win the war. With a new divine at the helm, Malady had a powerful ally. But she was in no hurry to call in her favor. After all, it might be the last thing she ever did. Having performed the greatest act of necromancy in history, Tarquin found the new world unchallenging. He became obsessed with rumors of another plane of existence. One day he vanished and was never seen again. The undead priestess Gratiana remained in her sanctuary, happy to wait for the war to pass. She was troubled only by the silence of her goddess. Jehan the demon hunter never stopped hunting for demons. Sahela sought to strengthen the Elven Alliance with the new divine. Her powers of sight proved useful in the ongoing war against the Void. But she could never be sure that the new divine trusted her. Tova, her mother, was Sahela's most trusted warrior. Sabeel wandered the world. She became a household name, famed the realm over as a traveling hero, celebrated wherever she went. Enjoying life to the fullest, she was truly and finally free. On his return to the Empire, the Red Prince was hailed a hero. He married Sada, and they had many more dragons. Soon, the Prince became the Emperor. Faced with dragons, the Void did not gain the upper hand in the Empire. Losa returned to her music and enjoyed a storied career as the Divine's premier musician. Dark moods would still overtake her, and she would spend long hours walking in the wilds. She always returned with a new song. And then there was you. For how much of this do you take credit or blame? And what kind of divine were you as the world battled on? Did you show mercy or strength? Did you sacrifice others as Lucian had done? Did you regret becoming divine? Should you have given your soul and sealed the veil? Only you know the truth. Only you know if you atone for your sins. <laughs>